Astronomical we're still, Association. We're, we're, we're still go, going live. Oh, we are not yet? Our, okay. All right, right. now, yeah, give me one second. All right, we are now live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third armchair star party from the San Jose Astronomical Association. Uh, we are really glad you all join us here. Uh, some of you may have seen our first two programs, uh, armchair star party programs, and some of you maybe uh, it's the first time you're seeing this. Either way, we have a great program lined up for you. We have a bunch of new objects for today, and uh, we have our volunteers waiting to uh, guide you through the rest of the program. So let's get this started. However, before we or get started with the program, I want to give you a couple tips to enjoy this program better. Uh, first one is to go to your YouTube settings, uh, uh, generally it's the upper right corner. Uh, under your uh, sign here, just click on it and you will find something called dark theme, turn it on. Uh, the second tip I want to give you is go to the, the right bottom corner of the YouTube and find this uh, gear and click on it and, uh, and pick 720p. Uh, this is the resolution. So we want to. We are going to show you astronomy event, uh, astronomy themed objects, which are dark background, and also we have very fine detail objects. So having these two settings in YouTube will help you to enjoy the program better. Okay. All right. So um, I want to take a few minutes to introduce our club and who we are, what we do. Uh, those of you who have seen this before, uh, well, uh, hang on. And those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, here it is. Uh, we are San Jose Astronomical Association. We call ourselves SJAA sometimes. Uh, we are established in 1954 as an educational organization, primarily uh, focus, our focus is astronomy and related sciences. Uh, we are located in San Jose, California, specifically in Hoagie Park, San Jose, California. And we have a lot of events uh, for our members as well as for our general public. So I want to take a couple of minutes talking about the events that we generally offer to the public. Now, keep in mind that we are in a special uh, time right now because of the COVID-19 situation. Some of these programs are uh, on hold or moved to a virtual event format. But normally, uh, if you happen to visit our club, we have a number of star parties we have a club does. Uh, just to name a few, we have what we call in-town star parties. Like a couple of times a month, we have in our headquarters. We have Starry Night Star Parties that we do once in a month in a dark sky site called Rancha Canada, Open Space Preserve. And we have uh, solar observing events, binocular observing events. We have special events at Yosemite and, and so forth. So many star parties that we do for our public. Uh, so it's not only star parties, we also have uh, public talks that we do. We have uh, introduction to Astronomy, Astronomy 101 talks. There's a talk that happened called Astronomy 101 just yesterday. Uh, we have once a month guest speaker programs where we invite uh, uh, people who are very uh, uh, knowledgeable people in astronomy, professors, uh, researchers, and ask them to talk about their, their uh, subject areas. And that's what we do once a month and, uh, uh, and, and so forth. So those are our public talks. We also do school staff parties for the neighborhood schools. Uh, we have uh, uh, dedicated members that we have in the club that goes to the school star parties and conduct um, star parties for our uh, school kids in the Bay Area. Uh, so what not? Uh, what else? We also do uh, equipment help for our public. We have swap meets where public can come in and buy and sell used gear. Um, so these are all our public programs we offer uh, to people out there. Uh, Public programs are not the only ones we do. We also have membership, it's $20 a year, quite cheap. But our membership comes with some special benefits. Uh, some of them could be doing imaging workshops. Imaging is astrophotography. Uh, we have beginner training. If you're a beginner and you're starting with astronomy, uh, we would help you to get started. we we'll help you to choose equipment using our Lona Telescope uh, program and our quick start program that we have. We have a library that's full of books, astronomy books our members can borrow. And lastly, we do uh, private events. We can open up dark sky sites for our members and you can go and enjoy night sky with uh, your fellow members. So all this for $20 a year. 
And uh, even if you appreciate our, what we do out here, and uh, I'd encourage you to check out the club website, sjaa.net, and, uh, and, and consider becoming a member and supporting us. So if you want to find our public programs, you can go to meetup.com and we are listed there. Okay, so that's a quick introduction to our club. Um, let me now slowly get started with today's program here. First, I want to introduce all our volunteers. Uh, well, myself here, my name is Kanj. I am uh, the person that usually organizes the intern star parties that we have. Um, and also I run the Lone Telescope program for the club. And uh, next comes uh, Carl and Rashi here. Carl and Rashi are our uh, Starry Night Dark Sky uh, Star Party leaders, and they are the one who organized that. You may have seen them if you have attended those programs before we went to the shutdown. Uh, Nancy, Nancy is uh, 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 one of the people who are involved in organizing our solar um, observing events that we do once a month, and she also helps out with uh, you know program like today. Uh, Swami, Swami is uh, an ex president of the club. Today, he's going to be our YouTube moderator for this program. And then comes Glenn and Bruce. Glenn and Bruce are our imaging program leaders. The imaging program is our astrophotography program. If uh, I know there are a lot of interest in this Bay Area for astrophotography, if you're interested in this, I encourage you to reach out to these two gentlemen. And uh, they have uh, a wealth of information and helpful programs that you can benefit from. All right, so then comes Wolf. Wolf, uh, you may have seen it because uh, Wolf does the solar program. He's a solar program leader and he also does the uh, Astronomy 101 talks, which he just did yesterday. And uh, today he's gonna help us with this program. All right, so lastly, well, not that, uh, not lastly, uh, we have Nicola and Joe. Uh, Nicola and Joe are our you know, imaging program members. Uh, they are going to help us today with uh, some live views and to show what they have done in their imaging uh, with their images and, and describe about them. So those are our volunteers from the SJA members. That's not all for today. We also have three new faces here. These are our interns. Hold on a second. Uh, you know, I lost the view here. Okay. okay, sorry about that. I lost the view here. So we have, these are our interns. So we have Chelsea, Sophie and uh, Lipika. Uh, they are, all three of them are high school students and they were very interested in astronomy and, and uh, they are actually going to present today with uh, uh, Rashi and Carl. And uh, so those of you out there who could be students, high school students, uh, college students, I encourage you to reach out to us. And uh, if you're interested in astronomy, uh, if you're learning astronomy or if you're just interested, if you want to help out, uh, you're welcome. Just uh, reach, out, reach out to us and somebody will respond. Okay. All right, so to talk a little bit about today's plan here. Um, the first one is sneak peek. We have Nancy who will walk through a quick introduction of what to come for the rest of the program today. And then we have Carl and Rashi and our interns coming in to take you through a tour of the night sky. And, uh, and they have some tweets and surprises coming in the way I heard uh, to talk about the night sky. And we will take a quick break. We'll take one or two questions um, in the quick Q&A session. Uh, actually, I would like to encourage you to, to ask your questions early so we can get to a few questions early here. You can ask your questions in the YouTube chat. Then we will dive into the main program, which is the armchair observing. And after that, we have a, uh, a special session called night vision observing. We will see how it is. Today is kind of unfortunately, the weather here in the Bay Area is quite warm and cloudy. So, but don't worry, we have uh, ways to compensate. So we'll see how the night vision observing goes. And uh, lastly, we have a Q&A &A session. So we will take all your questions and try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of this program. Okay, so that's our plan for today. And now 
um, I'll invite Nancy to come and take you through the sneak peek. Nancy. Nancy, you're on mute. Thank you, Khan. Sorry about that. Forgot to uh, unmute myself. Good evening. Welcome to Armchair Star Party. It's the best way to enjoy the nice guy from the comfort of your home. Thank you for joining us and happy dark days of summer. Um, first, let's check the weather. It's been extremely hot during the day and tonight there's some clouds. But no worries. We're going to still have a great tour of the August highlights. I know for some of us to figure out what's up in the sky can be overwhelming just because there's just so much to see and things do change throughout the entire year. And that's why we have selected a list of perfect objects for tonight's sky tour. On the top of my list, I do have double star and there are different types. Wolf has picked one for us that is nice and bright and easy to identify. Next, we'll offer you a, a diffuse nebula. A diffuse nebula is a cloud of widespread interstellar dust and gas. You get to see some images and uh, Bruce will be the one who walk us through it. We'll also get to learn about a globular cluster from Glenn. It's a collection of stars that are tightly bound by gravity. Okay. And for the galaxy ga category, Nicola will show us a very interesting galaxy and I look forward to it. Hey, Nancy, can yes. I stop you for a second? Did you at the very beginning say dog days of summer? Oh yes, I sure, <laughs> I sure did. In fact, dog days are actually named after Sirius, the dog star, referring to oh. um, the hottest time of the year in the Northern hemisphere. So during this period, the dog star Sirius and the sun both rise and set around the same time. And so ancient stargazers thought that the heat of Sirius combined with the sun produced the hottest weather. And that's how dark days of summer started. Wow, so, yeah. really, really interesting. I never knew that. Uh, yeah. Well, sounds like today is a really big dark day of summer then. And it's you're really right. Here. Absolutely, today is definitely a dark day. So for the year of 2020 this year, Dark days begin uh, in late July and it will continue into early September. And again, happy dark days, everybody. Um, back to our night sky objects. Uh, in addition to the others that I mentioned, we'll also get to see a couple of planets that appear to be close together this time around as observed from Earth. You probably already know by looking at the, the screen up there. Um, hey, Nancy. So, yes. You said couple of planets. What's the third one? Is there? is that a planet or some sort of a deep sky object? Um, so you're talking right. about the one on the lower right of the screen? Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's a special setup conch. And Joe will talk about this portable and rather unconventional way to set up an astro gear. Okay. So right. there, a sample of different objects in the sky just for you. Um, now, as you tour the night sky with us, Please notice that unless stated otherwise, the images are taken by our members and they are absolutely stunning. Okay, and that credit go to, majority of it goes to our imaging team. Now, let's check with a couple of speakers and see if we can take a look at their equipment. First, I'll look at Wolf's gear. Wolf's hosts uh, the Solar Observing Program uh, as we introduced earlier and the Astronomy 101 talk. His rig is set up in his backyard and he told me that the setup is not permanent and it's on a shaky ground. So let's check it out. Hey Wolf, are you ready to show us uh, your, set, uh, your setup? Your yeah, equipment? hey Nancy, how are you? And how's everybody out there? Thank you for joining us tonight. I hope it's not too hot where you're sitting um, such that you can enjoy the next hour or so with us here without melting into a puddle. Um, so yeah, so what Nancy is showing right now on screen is kind of a capture of the setup as it was a few days ago when I was kind of practicing for tonight's event. But I can try to show you what it looks like right now. So let me let me do that. Let me just click a couple of buttons here, see if we can get this to work. All right, so I hope you can see uh, a, an image of the remote desktop that goes to a laptop that's currently sitting in my yard. And, and right now you're seeing a picture of maybe an hour ago when I was sitting there setting up for tonight. And you can see me sitting there trying to jiggle the laptop into place and the telescope right now is pointing straight up, which is one of its calibration positions. And then 
um, you know, here is kind of what it looked like when the telescope was first swinging into position to look at tonight's object. So um, yeah, so here it is turning, getting ready to find the object that we're interested in for tonight. And then that gets us to here. This is what it looks like right now uh, in my backyard, just with the porch light on. So you can still see the telescope, you know, pointing to where we just moved it. And it is uh, trained on the object that we will look at together a little bit later. Uh, cross your fingers that we're not gonna get clouds. There were some earlier and they cleared up, you know, so let's hope it stays the way it is so that I can show you a live view later here. So uh, yeah, and the telescope that you're seeing, uh, maybe I'll go back to you know this view just so it's a little more clear. This is uh, a refractor, which means it's built with lenses, and uh, you know this is this is really a pretty temporary setup. In fact, this is kind of a new telescope I got, well, actually many months ago, but because of COVID nineteen, I've barely used it. So I really wanted to try it out for tonight, and so we're gonna you know try it out together. So thanks, Nancy. You want to go ahead and uh, share the other slide again? Let's see anything else worth saying on that. Okay, or we could just go ahead and move on to Joe. Hi, everyone. All right, so I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the setup uh, that I have going here. Um, unfortunately, because of clouds, I didn't have it fully um, set up outside, uh, but I, what I will be able to do is um, show a couple of things here. Um, let's see, is the, uh, is the camera pointing forward? Yeah, we can see you, Joe. Uh, Kant, you may want to stop sharing for a moment. So we can focus on Joe's camera. There we go. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, actually, my background here on Zoom is Comet Neowise, if I can just... Right there. Okay. So I just wanted to show everybody um, what I normally image with. Um, actually, I have to turn off the virtual background. So this is uh, a schmidt cassegrain telescope design. Um, and what it is, it's actually quite compact. Like you can see, um, you know, I can just pick it up here uh, with one arm. It's about, uh, it's about 15, uh, 15 so pounds or so. Uh, there's a mirror uh, right here near the front of the objective and then another mirror back here. And light entering the telescope um, goes through the front, hits the back mirror, reflects off the front mirror and then goes through the back where the camera is normally installed. So that's, uh, it's a double, uh, double folded design. Um, and then what I also normally uh, do is um, I use this thing called the night vision image intensifier, which amplifies light uh, about 60 to 80,000 times, uh, making faint objects in the sky really easy to, sh to look at. Unfortunately, because of the clouds, I won't be able to do a live demo of it. Uh, but I would like to show one more thing, which is um, my, uh, the, uh, the setup here with the Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, what it looks like in operation. So I'm going to uh, just really quickly uh, share this screen here. All right. And over here on the lower right, you'll see I have the um, Schmidt Cassegrain telescope sitting on an equatorial mount. Uh, that's, you know, this tripod you see here. Uh, and I'm at this event called uh, the Golden State Star Party. And uh, during the course of this night, um, my telescope is capturing images. And I also happen to do a time lapse of, um, of this setup. I'm just going to turn off the video. And I'm just going to play back the, uh, the time lapse. And you'll get to see kind so of Joe, we are going to do this later, right, Joe? I'm going to show um, a different video later. But I wanted to show this particular okay. video because it shows um, my imaging rig here, down here on the lower right in operation. And you can see as the, as the night progresses, the, the setup is also tracking the sky. It's, it's tracking the sky and it's capturing images um, as, it, as, it's, as the sky is moving. And Joe, right. I, saw a, I saw a red streak of light. Was that the flash visiting you at uh, GSSP? <laughs> right, right. There's all these uh, red streaks of light going back and forth. Um, that happens to be my headlamp. Uh, and when you're at a star party, like uh, the Golden State Star Party, everyone wears red headlamps, which I mentioned before, is uh, helps to preserve your night vision. Um, and uh, so, so that's what's going on back and forth. It looks like red lightning, uh, but it's actually just my headlamp, different people's headlamp. Uh -huh. 
Oops, got it. I thought I figured out who Barry Allen was. <laughs> All right, so yeah, there's, uh, so that's uh, what I have to share about uh, my imaging rig. Okay, so that was Joe. Thank you, Joe. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so Joe first attended SJ at uh, AA's in town start party many years ago as a student to learn more about Night Sky. And tonight he just came back and show us some uh, views through his telescope and night vision. Thank you both uh, Wolf and Joe, and we'll see you guys again shortly in the armchair observing segment. Now, we just saw the exterior com uh, components of the telescopes. How about, let's take a look at the interior components and Kanch is gonna help me with this. Kanch, what is your plan for our viewers? Same as the last time, are we gonna look at the inside of a refractor telescope? Kanch? Can need you to unmute. Yeah. You're on mute, Conch. There you go. They're still on mute, Conch. Go. Okay. Sorry about that. Are. I thought I unmuted myself. Welcome. Well, Nancy. We are not going to talk about refractor telescopes. We did talk about refractor telescopes last time. Where refractor telescopes has a lens in the, the front of the telescope to do the light gathering. Well, equally important, there is another design called the reflecting telescopes, which instead of a lens uses uh, mirrors to do the light gathering. So these are two different examples of reflector tel type telescopes. Uh, the, the one in the left and the one in the right seemingly look uh, about you know, similar size, but they're actually not. The, the one in the right is actually uh, what we call a tabletop telescope. It's fairly small. Uh, you can hold it with one hand. You can take it and put it on a car seat and easily move it. Uh, the one on the left is a fairly large telescope. And actually in practice, if you go to a star party, you would see that the telescope could be as tall as a grown person or even bigger. So, uh, and if you go to Star Party, you might see that there are some telescopes um, where people had to climb up uh, two or three steps on a, on a ladder. That's a reflector type of telescope. These type of telescopes, they use uh, a set of mirrors. Uh, there's one called a primary mirror and one called a secondary mirror to collect and, and manipulate light. Uh, so I have uh, some word in here called Dobsonian that I put it in here, just because this type of design is also called a Dobsonian design. So if you go to a star party and you see a telescope and you ask someone else, uh, you know, what kind of telescope is that? And that person says, oh, that's a Dob or a Dobsonian. Uh, well, that's still a reflecting telescope. It's named uh, after a famous telescope designer called uh, John Dobson. He happened to be a Bay Area resident and, uh, and uh, this kind of telescopes got really popular that he designed among the, uh, the amateur astronomy so, uh, 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 folks. Oh, That's so nice. That, yeah, so nice to know that he's also from San Francisco. I, did, I didn't know that piece. Um, but Kanj, can you explain yeah. just a little more maybe how it works? Yes, Nancy. So that's going to be the next slide. So hopefully my computer will Cooperate. Oh, there you go. All right. So this is uh, how the inside of the telescope look like. Now, again, on the right here, you would see the two telescopes I just showed you. This is the, the, the tabletop type, and this is the Dobsonian type. If you take the tube and if you cut in half, this is what you would see inside. Um, well, let's see how this works. You have a galaxy out here and the light from the galaxy comes through the tube of the telescope. And at the very bottom of the telescope, you have a mirror. Um, and this is uh, a curved mirror, uh, it's called a concave mirror. And the mirror is such a way that this parallel light that's come through this tube gets bent in such a way that it comes to a focus somewhere at the very top of this uh, tube here. Uh, Kanch, wait, wait, yeah. give me a second. Um, what is that small object in the way? Yeah, so this one, you can see uh, the light doesn't quite come to a focus here, it hits this what we call a secondary mirror. It's a flat mirror. It actually turns the light to the side of the telescope tube. That's what it's- uh, one, one, one more question. Why would you want to turn, move, move the light to the side? Well, I'm glad you asked. Well, otherwise you had to put your eyes or your head right on the top of here and block the light that's coming from the galaxy itself. So that's why you had to turn the light to the sideways so you can actually see it from the side of the telescope tube. 
Okay, one more question, and I promise I'll let you finish your okay. piece. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. What's the other green thing next to the person's eye? Are uh, you talking about this one? Yeah. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is called an eyepiece. Kind of looks like a magnifying glass, right? So that's kind of what it does. Uh, if you take, if you want to just magnify something, you put the magnifying glass between your eye here and uh, say the object here, and you move that back and forth to get the right focus and magnification. That's exactly what this piece does. Now, how it looks like in real life is like this. So this is called an eyepiece. And this one here is called an eyepiece. So what it does is it does the magnification you need uh, uh, to see the object you want to see. Um, now, normally these eyepieces are interchangeable. So if you go to a star party, you would see the people who are manipulating telescopes, they will uh, you know, pick one, this thing up and move it, you know, replace it with something else to get the different level of magnification, either higher or lower magnification, depends on what they want to see. And that's what this, uh, this thing does. And normally it can be moved by these little knobs here, uh, which is what we call a focuser. So you go back and forth, just like you, you move um, a magnifier that you use. Um, so that's the design of a telescope. So what it does is it actually gathers a lot of light. The bigger this primary mirror, the more light you collect, the more information you collect. Um, and the gathered light needs to be magnified because uh, even if you look at a moon, the moon is a very bright object, but you really can't, you can stare at the moon all you want, but you can't really see the craters of the moon in that detail. So in order to see the detail, you need to magnify. So two, two functions. Uh, refractive telescope does just like what I described before in the last segment, the refractive telescope does. This does is in a different way. Um, so one last thing I want to say is like most of the large telescopes that you would see or hear about, like the, the Hubble Space Telescope or the Keck Telescope in Monarchia and so forth, all of those are some sort of a reflector design. Um, it's they're not generally just reflector design, but they have a reflector component for it. They have mirrors associated with those telescopes. So there you go. All That's right, so point. thank you. So essentially they both work under the same set of principle, but just different designs. Yes. Right, okay, thank you. That was quite informative and I did learn a lot from you. Um, now that you've got a glimpse of this equipment and an understand that how they work in just a little while, we'll get to see these telescopes in action, okay? So if you're new to this, when we talk about planets, stars, and night nice sky, I'm sure there are many questions that come to mind. We hope to answer some of your questions in our next segment, the night nice sky. So the night nice sky team, the stage is yours. Awesome, thank you, Nancy, appreciate that. Great job, you guys. So my name is Rashi. Welcome to the Night Sky segment. I'll be co-hosting this segment with Carl and our wonderful interns, Lipika, Chelsea, and Sophie. Now, what we typically do for the folks that are joining us for the first time, what we typically do is we go over some content and we serenade you with a lot of wonderful pictures that have been taken by SJ members. Uh, we talk about some facts. We talk about uh, highlights of the month um, that, are, you know, that are key, that are fun, that you can actually go in action on, which means go out and take a look at that night itself or during the course of the month. And then after that, we walk you through the night sky using a planetarium application. We've got a little bit of a surprise for you this time around. So stay tuned. I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is, but stay tuned. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun for you. And we're going to do something different uh, with the planetarium app. Uh, and it's a way to enable you to learn more about the night sky very quickly and rapidly. So let's go ahead and get started. Carl, what's up in the night sky? Well, there's a lot. <laughs> you are absolutely right. There is a lot in the night sky, a whole universe worth of a lot in the night sky. And we're just scratching the surface on this slide. And of course, we don't have much time, so we're gonna keep it short, but let's take a look at some things that we can see either with our naked eyes or with a little bit of assisted viewing, binoculars and some telescopes. So we'll start off with our solar system on the top left. Let me get the pointer enabled here. And when we talk about our solar system, let's start off with our sun or our star. Uh, the sun is a star, it's a yellow dwarf. Our solar system is a one star system. And of course, around this sun happen to be planets and dwarf planets. We've got eight planets and five dwarf planets. And these planets and dwarf planets also end up having moons. Our earth has one moon, Mars has two moons, 
Jupiter is in second place at 79, and Saturn at first place with 82. What else do we see in the night sky? At least in the scope of our solar system, we get to see other satellites. We get to see asteroids, meteor showers, right? shooting stars, and of course, comets. And now talking about comets, we did have a comet visitor last month. We will show you some beautiful images of the comets again, um, actually on the next slide uh, in just a few moments. And we'll explain a couple of things about comets as well that you might find very, very interesting. Now, coming back to our star, our sun, which is a yellow dwarf, is, a, is just one star in our solar system, right? You see it throughout the day, keeps us warm, keeps us alive. But you can have stars that are in multiple different other configurations. So let's look at binary star systems, right? Binary star systems, binary meaning two. So you would have two suns. If they are gravitationally bound, they're either one is orbiting the other, or they might be in a spiral dance in the heavens. They're gravitationally bound. That happens to be a true binary star system. A visual binary is when they look like they're very close to each other, but in three-dimensional space, they actually might be pretty far apart. That's when we have a visual binary. Now we're actually gonna to get to see a visual binary tonight and uh, Wolf's gonna be helping us out there. As we pass binary star systems and you tag on another star, then you have a three star system and a fourth star system, right? And those are multiple star systems. And then moving on from multiple star systems, we graduate to open clusters where we have hundreds to thousands, low thousands of stars dispersed in the night sky, pretty much imagine as if they were social distancing using the, you know, the, the COVID terminology for right now. Eventually over time, these open clusters will disperse further out millions and millions, years, millions of years out. But then we've got another type of cluster that we can take a look at, which is a globular cluster, a very, very dense structure of stars from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of stars, maybe even close to a million. Now these dense structures, these globular clusters are ancient structures. We have about 150 of these pretty much circumnavigating or orbiting our own galaxy. And they, it is theorized that they are cores of smaller galaxies, galaxies that our galaxy has, Milky Way has consumed, but these cores, these remnants are have stayed around and they're pretty much going around our galaxy through the core of our galaxy. Now, of course, everyone has heard of the 12 zodiacal constellations. Um, I am a Scorpio. You might have, uh, you know, your, your uh, zodiac based on the month that you were born in, but there are actually 88 constellations that have been cataloged by the International Astronomical Union. Within these constellations, there are human recognizable patterns called asterisms. So we'll get to see a teapot tonight. We'll get to see a pan and panhandle. And we actually do have that pan and panhandle right in front of us. So these four stars form the pan and then the three stars form a handle. And this you will find in Ursa Major, the Big Dipper. We also have star clouds, dense structures of a lot of, lot of stars and we call the star clouds and then nebulae, which are massive clouds of interstellar gas and dust. And especially when the density of these nebulae is high, they are star forming regions or stellar nurseries and that's where stars are born. So we'll actually get to see uh, a, it, as Nancy mentioned, a diffuse nebula uh, later on tonight. And of course, to contain all of this, we've got these massive containers called galaxies and they come in different shapes and forms, spiral, bar spiral, elliptical, and irregular. Now we talked about that we had a comet visitor. So let's take a look at a couple of beautiful images, actually a few images of Comet Neovice. Comet Neovice was discovered on March 27th by the Neovice Space Telescope. Last month, middle, early to mid-July, it was actually visible to the naked eye, and it won't come back for another 6,800 years. Now, could you still see it in the night sky? You potentially could, not, by, not with the naked eye. You would need either very, very powerful binoculars or a uh, telescope, but it would be very faint um, as it is rapidly moving away from us. I do want to pull your attention to this middle, bottom middle uh, picture of the comet taken by Hitesh. And it showcases two tails. The brighter uh, curved tail is a dust tail of particulates and gases. And it's uh, pretty much reflecting the light of the sun. And as a, as a result, you're getting to see that gray color reflecting off. But the other tail has a bluish color to it. So let me explain what happens. Now, comets typically are massive pieces of rock with a lot of ice, frozen ice. Now, that ice is not necessarily water ice, but ice of methane, 
ammonia, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, cyanide, and other constituents, but those are the major constituents found to date for ice on comets. Now, as this comet gets closer to the sun, the ultraviolet light ends up energizing carbon monoxide, creating car uh, diatomic carbon ions, and they end up glowing blue. And they get pushed away from the sun in the opposite direction of the sun due to the pressure of the solar winds. And that's why you get to see the straight line as a streamer shooting off in the opposite direction of the sun. Beautiful, beautiful picture. On the right-hand side, we've got two images taken by Rick. Post July 4th, his neighbor actually had some extra fireworks uh, that he was, uh, he was lighting up and Rick was able to capture these two beautiful images through the fireworks. But what's interesting about the bottom right image, you can actually see a green hue what we call green coma of the comet. So when the comet gets even closer to the sun, a lot of that ice starts to melt. And we end up with a diffuse particle layer of gases and particles enveloping the core, uh, the nucleus of the, uh, of the comet. And we have an abundance of diatomic carbon molecules and cyanide molecules. And as a result, Carl, you mind going on mute? Carl, can you go on mute please? Cut it. Awesome. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so we have a lot of uh, diatomic carbon molecules and cyanide. And when ultraviolet light hits uh, those molecules, they glow bright green, an emerald green or a teal green. And uh, what we get to see is this streaking emerald through the night sky. Again, beautiful, beautiful images. Now, we are in the middle of August. And tonight's a great night to get out past midnight to see a bunch of planets. Carl, you want to help our audience out with uh, what planets they can see tonight? Sure. Naked eye planets tonight are Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter. Using binoculars or telescopes, you may find or see Uranus and Neptune. Poor Pluto is between Saturn and Jupiter, but will be very hard to find. Right over there. Yep. So Saturn and Jupiter, and then on the other side, we have uh, Uranus and Mars. Now, Carl, on um, early in the morning, I think around 3.15 a.m., and we'll move over to the next slide. So on the top left, we get to see some more artifacts that show up right above the eastern horizon. You want to talk about that as well? Yeah. Up on the east, it would be a thin crescent moon and another naked eye planet, Venus. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the moon's in a crescent phase. And then Venus, if you were able to zoom in with a telescope, you're actually going to see it exhibiting a half moon sort of phase. Uh, absolutely beautiful. Now, keep in mind that Venus is now showing up in the morning. Uh, so that means that Venus is ahead of Earth in its orbit. And when Venus is behind Earth in its orbit, we end up with Venus showing up in the evenings. Um, we have had some, we have had two interesting missions in the last couple of weeks. Lipika, you want to help our uh, viewers with uh, information about these missions? Yeah, so the first mission was the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover, which launched on July 30th, and it's on its way right now to Mars, planned to arrive on February 18th, 2021. When it gets there, it's going to search for signs of ancient microbial life which will help us answer our questions about the past habitability on Mars. The rover will drill core samples of rock and soil, and then it's going to store them for scientists to later analyze. The oh, second, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So the second image is the Dragon, which is a privately developed spacecraft from SpaceX, the first ever private company to have carried astronauts to orbit. Dragon, this time, the mission was to carry cargo to the ISS as well as two astronauts. So just at the beginning of this month on August, it splashed at sea. So Carl, can you tell us about the triangle on the right? Sure, thank you. The summer triangle is very prominent now. If you step out after the program, you'll notice the three stars. The brightest one is Vega and it is very prominent. Oh, very prominent. Uh, Rashi, will talk about the summer triangle a little later. Absolutely. We'll definitely be touching on the Summer Triangle quite a bit uh, in this show. 
but it is a it is a beautiful structure to go and take a look at three bright stars belonging to three different constellations and of course when you turn on these imaginary lines in your head and you go and take a look you're going to see this big 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 triangle in the night sky and vega as carl said will be right above you if you step out uh now or after the show and uh, find this really bright star right literally close to the zenith so we talked about a bunch of planets being visible to the night sky. And there are two planets that we really want to focus in on and hone in on are Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter and Saturn are the fifth and sixth planets. They are the biggest planets in our solar system. Now, Jupiter, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are also massive. I mean, they are massive gas giants. And what we're going to do is we're going to segue into some informational slides uh, where Chelsea, Lipica, and Sophie are going to talk about Jupiter and Saturn. Yeah, so just like Rashi said, Jupiter is the King Kong planet of our solar system. It's more, it's more than twice as massive as all the other planets combined. So being a gas giant, its atmosphere is composed primarily of hydrogen and helium. So that's the same helium that we, um, in the balloons, we suck air out of to give us the high-pitched voice. Right. The fifth planet in our solar system, Jupiter, is located 5.2 astronomical units from our own planet. Its rotational period is the shortest of all planets, 10 hours. In only 10 hours, the same time it takes to fly from California to Japan, Jupiter has completed an entire rotation. Its orbital period is almost 12 years long. Jupiter also has an incredibly strong magnetic field that blasts surrounding areas at particles. Even if you were standing 3 million kilometers away from Jupiter, you would still feel its effects. To put this in perspective, this is a 50th of an astronomical unit. One of the most prominent features of Jupiter is larger than our Earth and is called the Red Spot. This spot is actually a giant storm that has been raging on for over 300 years with speeds up to 425 miles per hour. The size of the storm is varying and is always shrinking. Not only is Jupiter the largest planet, but it also has 79 moons, making it the second place winner among all the other planets. The four most known and largest moons on Jupiter are Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. All of these were discovered by the amazing Galileo. Ganymede is the largest moon in the entire solar system, and it's the only moon to have its own magnetic field. Europa is one of the most promising places in our solar system to find suitable environments for life. So current research is actually allowing us, allowing scientists to predict that beneath Europa's icy surface, there's a vast salty water ocean. Io is the most vulcan volcanically active and um, Callisto has lots of craters on its surface. So that makes it the most heavily cratered object in the solar system. The stripes seen on the surface of Jupiter are clouds of ammonia and water. Although toxic to humans, Jupiter's atmosphere creates beautiful swirls and bands that it is well known for. Due to Jupiter's fast spinning, jet streams are formed. These jet streams create the dark and bright belt seen on its surface. There have been nine missions dedicated to Jupiter exploration. Pioneer 10 being the first spacecraft to fly past the planet, and Juno being the most recent expedition, which launched in 2011. Through all of these missions, scientists have been able to understand Jupiter's atmosphere and magnetosphere, as well as its icy and volcanic moons. Next up, we have Saturn, which is the sixth planet from the sun. It is the second largest planet and its most prominent feature are its majestic rings. Its atmosphere is composed primarily of hydrogen and helium and its solid core is composed of iron and nickel. One day at Saturn is less than half of Earth's standing at 10 and a half hours, so approximately the time you spend at work daily. It takes Saturn almost 30 years to orbit the sun once, so if you are 20 years old now, you would still be less than one year old on Saturn. The yellow and gold bands seen in Saturn's atmosphere are the result of super fast winds, which can reach up to 1100 miles per hour, two times the typical cruising airspeed of a long distance passenger aircraft. The large white spot visible in Saturn's upper hemisphere are reoccurring storms. The difference in density between water and Saturn's hydrogen and helium atmosphere causes cooling and eventually a thunderstorm to form. 
These storms occur every 20 to 30 years and have been observed only six times over the past 140 years. Additionally, Saturn has a hexagon storm. This hexagon is a vortex located at Saturn's North Pole, created by an atmospheric jet stream. This storm is so large that two whole Earths could fit inside. Saturn has 82 moons, making it the winner amongst all the other planets in the solar system. My two favorites are Titan and Enceladus because they are both potential candidates for life. Titan has the organic compounds we need, plus it's exactly how our initial Earth used to be, a big ball of methane. Enceladus, on the other hand, is cold and has an icy surface. Evidence from the Cassini probe suggests that underneath its icy surface, it has a vast liquid ocean. Also, a fun way to remember the moon Enceladus is to think of enchiladas. When most think Lipica, of Saturn- you're making... oh. oh, I was just gonna say, Lipika, you're making me hungry now. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to go find some enchiladas. Let's continue. All right. <laughs> when most think of Saturn, they usually think of Saturn's famous ring system. Named in an A to G system and each orbiting Saturn at unique speeds, these seven rings are made up of chunks of ice and rock, believed to be products of broken asteroids and comets. The rings are also growing and being fueled by Saturn's moon Enceladus. Enceladus has ice volcanoes, which pump the moon's water directly to the rings. Saturn's rings extend out for, for 175,000 miles, seven times their Earth's circumference. However, they're actually only 30 feet thick, which is only about three stories. There have been four dedicated missions to understand Saturn further. Pioneer 11 was the first man-made object to fly past Saturn, while Voyager 1 and 2 were assigned to investigate the dynamics and structure of Saturn's atmosphere. The Cassini orbiter, launched in 1997, revealed more complexity in Saturn's moons and made scientists believe that Saturn's moons could potentially be hospitable to some form of life. Wow. That was amazing, guys. So much information that you guys shared. Absolutely brilliant. Now, we learned when we talked about Jupiter that Jupiter's diameter is roughly about 11 Earth widths. And Saturn's diameter is roughly about 9.5 Earth widths. So I have a question for the folks on the stream. If we were, if Jupiter was a big ball that we were able to fill up with Earth-sized marbles and bags and bags and bags of Earth-sized marbles, how many Earths could actually fit inside Jupiter? So I don't want you to Google this. I don't want you to use any search engine, but I would like for a few of you guys to take a stab and put in the comments, how many Earths you think could fit inside Jupiter? Swami, can you help us out to see if anybody responds? Yes, Rashi, I'll keep an eye out. Thank you. All right, guys, we're waiting on guesses. All right, we'll give everybody another few seconds to respond. I see Anna Choi coming back with about 578. All right. Who else? What other numbers can we get? Can we get two more guesses, please? Yeah, I'm going to kick One thousand. One thousand. All right. No, 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 Conch. We're not going to kick anyone out. No, no, no. Karen says 1,500. Wow, awesome guesses, guys. You guys are pretty darn close. We can actually have about 1,300 Earths that can fit inside Jupiter. Now, if we did the same exercise with Saturn, we would end up with about 764 Earths that could fit inside Saturn. Now, of course, that's excluding the rings, okay? Of course, we, if we included the rings, that'd be a lot more, but, but we're gonna exclude the rings for this exercise. Now, that's just giving you a sense of how big these planets are. But there's also one, one other supergiant structure in our solar system, and that happens to be our sun. I mean, yes, our sun is a yellow dwarf, so it is relatively a smaller sun, but it's still pretty darn big. So 1,300 Earths could fit inside Jupiter, and about 1,000 Jupiters could fit inside the sun, doing some simple multiplication 
1.3 million Earths could fit inside the sun. That's a lot of Earths. Now, if you want to learn more about the sun and different types of suns out there and different sizes of suns out there, I would recommend that you join Wolf on his Solar Sunday talk. He's got a beautiful video that talks about different types of suns and different sizes of suns. And just to, just to intrigue you a little bit, imagine if the biggest known sun happened to be a massive beach ball, our sun would be just a ballpoint pen dot on a piece of paper next to it. So hopefully you'll join Wolf on the Solar Sunday and get to see this amazing video and of course all the other content that he talks about. Now we did talk about a little bit of a surprise for you. So we were definitely shooting for some live views of Jupiter and Saturn. But I'm gonna go ahead and reach out to our astro imagers and see if clouds have cleared up. If not, I'm sure that they have some ex very recent pictures or videos that they can share with us. Glenn, how is it looking out there? Uh, well, it's popping in and out. Uh, let me share my screen. Yes, please, go ahead. So first of all, just to get oriented, um, Here's my telescope as it's currently pointing at uh, Jupiter. And there's actually a couple different uh, telescopes on here. Uh, I'm using this uh, big 12 inch uh, Ritchie Crichton reflector for uh, the planets tonight. And then uh, uh, if we get to see the globular cluster, it'll be this smaller refractor on the top. And there's actually four different cameras that we're utilizing for that. Um, let me jump over to the telescope screen. Uh, in the upper right here, this is uh, a camera on the top of my house so that I can see what's going on with the weather. And you see here, this uh, white little white dot there is actually Jupiter. Uh, it just came out behind from behind this palm tree. You can see in the lower right here, uh, this is Stellarium with a model of my uh, surroundings. So this big black area is the palm tree and this is Jupiter that just came out from behind it. Uh, but you can see that there's a bunch of clouds around this, this uh, white dot, which is Jupiter. And on the lower left over here, uh, you'll see that uh, that's the live view of Jupiter as it, as it peeks in and out from uh, these clouds. And uh, the, the focus is, is uh, fuzzy because it's relatively low in the, uh, in the sky. It's about 30 degrees in elevation. So there's lots and lots of atmosphere that we're looking through. And that's why the focus kind of goes in and out as we're, uh, as we're watching that. And so, you know, to get uh, good sharp views of that, people do what's called lucky imaging, where they take just a whole bunch of video frames, the faster, the better, and uh, then try to uh, put those together, taking the best uh, sections, the best frames to construct an, an image. Uh, and I can give you a little preview of that while that's going there. Um, so this is, uh, I took, uh, the upper half of this is uh, views from my telescope that I took earlier in the week. And there's uh, my lucky imaging uh, view of Jupiter. And you can see here, this is a composite uh, view because you need different exposures to show Jupiter versus the moons. But here you can see four of the moons of Jupiter and then uh, Jupiter itself. And here is the, the same view from the same point in time from Stellarium so that you can see the moons uh, and their, their names and where their positions are relative. So that's, that's uh, more of an example of what you, what you can do in, in processing an, an image of Jupiter. But let's, let's go back and um, need to get this closed, go back and see if we've got any better live view going on here. Yeah, so still a lot of clouds moving through, but um, you got to see a little bit of <laughs> Jupiter peak, peak between the clouds. Okay. Awesome, thank you, Glenn. Sure. All right, now we'll move over to Joe. Joe, what do you have for us about Saturn? 
Hi, everyone. Um, uh, sorry, let me just, uh, let me just turn this off. OK. So um, I wanted to show live views of Saturn today. But unfortunately, because of the weather, uh, I won't be able to do that. Uh, but I do have some images that I've taken recently of Saturn. And um, I'd like to kind of show some of that. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. So we're going to start off um, with an image from 2018. And uh, this was a visible light image of Saturn. Um, it was done, uh, you know, visible light meaning it, it's the, the same uh, colors and light spectrum that our eyes see. Uh, this was done um, using lucky imaging. So basically, uh, a video of Saturn was taken. And because Saturn tends to um, kind of shimmer a little bit as the air is not that steady, um, it tends to kind of wobble in the sky. Uh, basically, the best frames from Saturn were pulled out. And those frames were then selected for stacking and sharpening. Um, and then you get this beautiful image of Saturn here. A um, couple things about this image. If any of you ever get a chance to look at Saturn through a telescope, uh, pay attention to two things to see how good your view of Saturn is. The first is if you can see the space between the planet, the edge of the planet here, and the, and the edge of this ring. If you can see that space, that's a pretty good, pretty good um, uh, experience of Saturn. You know, I'd say, I'd say um, average to above average. And then the second thing that if you're able to see is the space between the rings. There's actually something here called the Cassini division. Uh, the, the ring is actually has, has a little thin black line uh, going around it. And if you're able to see that, then you have really excellent conditions for Saturn. That would be truly an exceptional, exceptional night. Now I'm going to show you uh, an alternate view of Saturn. And this is what I was hoping to show to you live. But unfortunately, we're just going to have uh, this image here. Um, I took this recently through a methane filter. Um, methane is actually the, uh, the component of uh, the primary component of natural gas. Um, it's used for um, a lot of like uh, industrial purposes. Um, it's uh, it's very naturally occurring uh, both in the ground and in the sea. Uh, it's formed by geological biological processes. Um, but through a methane filter, uh, Saturn looks completely different. It looks uh, like this glowing, uh, glowing halo. Um, and, uh, and it's also, the, the frequency of methane is also outside the range of visible light. So this, uh, to, our, to our eyes, we don't see the gas. The gas is uh, completely uh, colorless. Um, but through the filter, it brings out this, um, this, this uh, halo. Uh, and, I, and, I, and, it, and it's a little blurry right now because it didn't go through the same uh, processing and sharpening that Saturn on the left get in, in visible light, uh, but with with some processing, uh, you can in theory also get a get a very very um, interesting image of Saturn uh, through the methane filter. Um, so this goes to show kind of like where in Saturn are all of the, uh, the diff you know using different filters, you can get a sense of like the chem chemical composition of Saturn. You get the sense of okay, there's more methane in the rings and not as much in the cent cent central core. Of the planet. So, um, so these are views of Saturn. And one more thing I'll highlight is that between 2017 and 2020, or sorry, 2018 and 2020, between these two images, the tilt of Saturn also very slightly uh, changed. It's, it's no longer as, the, the rings are no longer as open towards, um, towards us as they are now. It, it, it's gradually beginning to close. And in uh, a number of more years, uh, Saturn will be almost edge on, meaning that you'll just be able to see the, uh, the rings as a, as a thin line rather than as uh, being completely open to us. So yep, that's, uh, that's all I had. And um, back to uh, back to uh, Ashi. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Awesome. That was pretty awesome. All right. Let me uh, go ahead and take the share back over. So now we're going to get into a Stellarium application, uh, the planetarium application called Stellarium. But rather than going into the desktop application like we typically do and have done in the last two uh, star parties, we are going to showcase the web version of uh, Stellarium. So let's take a look at the web app. So of course, I already have it loaded here. You would go into stellarium.org. And here you can download your desktop version as well. 
but there is an icon here in the header called Slurm Web. It's a great tool. It's an easy tool. You just click on it. It should give me a pop-up for uh, uh, allowing location detection. Uh, some browsers do, some browsers don't. There we go, allow location access. I will agree on the cookies and it should automatically try to set me up with uh, the time of day or night. I'm gonna go ahead and take a quick peek at the view settings on the top right gear icon here. I want to see the Milky Way, yes. DSS, D sky objects, sure. Simulate refraction, which means the atmosphere, absolutely. We'll go ahead and click close and click on the hamburger icon to close the left side menu. Time-wise, I think we're at the right time, roughly about 9.46, 9.47, so that is accurate. And we will move into full screen mo uh, mode by clicking on this uh, square edged icon uh, in the dock below. So let's go ahead and do that. Perfect, now we are in full screen mode. So we happen to be looking north. And uh, I can say we're looking north definitely because, of course, I've got this big N at the bottom of uh, or right above the horizon. So I know I'm looking north. But Carl, help our viewers out here. If that big N was not there and you were actually looking at a section of the night sky, how would you really find north? Well, look for the Big Dipper or the Pan Ananda that you mentioned earlier. The mm -hmm. two, the two pointer stars will point to Polaris, which would be north. Absolutely right. So let's go and find that pan and pan handle. Can you guys see the pan and pan handle? Some of you guys in the stream, if you can type in yes. But here you go. Here is the pan. And then of course, you've got the pan handle. And what Carl was talking about the pointer stars, uh, let me go back to the drawing tool again. Actually, we'll pick a different one. These two are the pointer stars. Now, where do they point? They point directly in the direction of Polaris. So let's go ahead and draw that arrow there. That star over there is the North Pole star, Polaris. And that is the tail star of Ursa Minor, uh, which is a little bear. And the pan and the pan handle is an asterism in the Ursa Major Big Dipper constellation. Now, you can also follow this arc and arc to Arcturus in the Bootes constellation, of course. Uh, Ursa Major is a great anchor constellation from which you can get to many other constellations in the night sky. We, in the last show, talked about Arcturus and uh, Spica and Virgo and how to navigate through some of the other constellations and structures. But our focus is going to be a little different uh, in this show. We're going to focus more on the Summer Triangle and then, of course, how do we get to the southern constellations or South Sky constellations rather, let me put it that way, not the Southern Hemisphere. We are focusing only on the Northern Hemisphere constellations, what we can see or what I can see here from the Bay Area, California. Now, this is a application. So I can go ahead and turn on those imaginary lines that otherwise you cannot do so in the real night sky. And we will overlay that with some constellation art to show you what our ancestors thought of or dreamt about when they looked at the heavens. So I'm going to go ahead and clear out very quickly these drawings. And whomever is that's not speaking, could you please go on mute? Thank you. So let's go ahead and turn the constellations on. And there you go. We've turned on those imaginary lines with this wonderful web application. And you can see the Ursa Major, the Big Bear constellation lines that have turned on. You've got Ursa Minor, you've got Draco the Dragon wrapping around Ursa Minor, Cepheus, the king of the mythical kingdom of Ethiopia, Cassiopeia, his wife, and so on and so on. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of these very shortly. But let's take a look at what the constellation art brings for us. Now you can really start to see the Big Bear showing up, right? And you've got uh, these two dots down here and these two over here pretty much that help you identify where the back paws are and then of course the front right paw. The tail is that pan handle and then as we come forward we've got the head of the big bear. You got Ursa Minor, the little bear here, you can see Draco the dragon. Now Carl, how does one get to the summer triangle from Ursa Major, from Polaris, from finding the North Pole Star, how do we navigate to 
the summer triangle. Well, we could use the dipper itself, go right to Draco, the mm -hmm. dragon, and it should head right towards the summer triangle. Or right now, just look straight up and you'll see one of the stars, Vega. Yeah. So starting from the east, if you look straight up, pretty much close to Zenith, we have Vega in Lyra. Vega, the harp star. Lara is the, the harp constellation. But what Carl was alluding to earlier on is the left two stars of the pan will point directly to the head of the dragon. But if you continue going, you can actually make your way to the summer triangle and pretty much get in the vicinity of where Vega happens to be. Another way to do this really is on the right two stars, the pointer stars, um, what we have is Moroccan Dubé. If you go from this one right through Ursa Minor, you can get to the Summer Triangle as well. So that's another wonderful trick of being able to get to the Summer Triangle. Now, what is the Summer Triangle? Summer Triangle is this imaginary triangle in the night sky. Oops, let me go ahead and clear that arrow out. Go back to mouse mode and move the heavens a little bit, of course, only in the application. I wish I could do that in reality, but I cannot. Summer triangle is this imaginary triangle that connects three bright stars in three different constellations. Vega in the harp of the Lyra constellation. And then we've got Altair, which is a heart star in Aquila the eagle, or Aquila the eagle. Deneb, the tail star of Cygnus, the swan. When we connect all three, we end up with the summer triangle. And what's really cool is if we actually made an arrow out of this, such that Altair was the tip of the arrow, this arrow pretty much points southward. So keep that in mind because we're actually going to call that reference out a couple of times in order for us to get to, this, to the, the couple of constellations in the southern sky. Now we've got, we're going to be looking at a couple of different uh, artifacts tonight, about four different artifacts tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off the, uh, the constellation art for right now. I'll leave the constellation lines on, but Alberio is that visual binary that we were talking about. Oh, that's not the one. Let's click out of it again. And there we go. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. And of course, this is not going to do any justice. Uh, the image that's coming up for you guys uh, and the view that's coming up for you guys in the armchair observing segment that is going to do amazing justice but what you really get to see here is that it splits into two the small one is a sapphire blue uh, star and then the larger one is a beautiful golden star again a visual binary which means in three-dimensional space they're pretty far apart but from our vantage point they look pretty close to each other and they seem to look like a binary. For a long time, we thought that they were a true binary, but as we, as our techniques are getting better and better with time, we identify that it is actually truly a visual binary. So I'm gonna zoom back out. And if I remember right, Carl, somewhere between Cepheus and Cygnus, the swan, uh, we have a beautiful galaxy do you remember what the name of that galaxy was so I can search for it? Yeah, it must be the Fireworks Galaxy. Oh, yes, the Fireworks Galaxy. So let's go to the search tool up top, show you guys how that works. I'll go ahead and click on the Fireworks Galaxy right here. And voila, it has pretty much buttered into the crosshairs. On the left-hand side, you can get to see other names for it, uh, the, the C12. And there's information, it actually points to the Wikipedia page, gives you some information right here as well, the azimuth and altitude and so on and so forth. But let's go ahead and zoom in. Carl, do you remember, or do you know why it's actually called the Fireworks Galaxy? Yeah, the Fireworks Galaxy gets its name from the 10 supernovae that were observed in the last century. 10 massive firecrackers have gone off in that spiral galaxy in the last 100 years. That is amazing. And two of our astro imagers have actually been able to capture uh, supernova from, uh, I believe, 2017. And we'll talk about that. Now, what's interesting, and of course, this is absolutely not planned, but uh, on the left of this fireworks galaxy happens to be a cluster of stars, an open cluster, it seems like. Let's go ahead and click on it. 
Now, as I said, this is not planned, but you know, this is a new tool that we're showcasing. We want you to learn this tool. Uh, but this is how sometimes you go and find stuff, right? Things that you might be that might look interesting. You click on it and you know, take a look and see what it might be called. And of course, this is called the ghost bush cluster. And apparently its other name is the flying geese cluster. And if I remember right, memory serves me right, in our last star party, we took a look at the wild duck cluster. So of course, there's some fun names uh, to remember as you go and search and find a lot of these objects in the night sky. Now we're going to work our way to the south. And of course, you see this amazing streak of light going from south to north, and that is the arm of the Milky Way. And as the night progresses, it is going to go ahead and move across the night sky from east to the west. Absolutely beautiful. If you're out in a dark sky location, you should be able to see this Milky Way streaking over you. And it's one of the most breathtaking views you can actually have. Now, if you guys remember, we said if we drew a triangle between Deneb, Vega, and Altair, and Altair was the tip of the, the arrow, it would pretty much point in the south direction, well, almost in the south direction. That at least gets you oriented where south is. And of course, the other way is once you know where the North Pole Star is, you can just turn up and look right behind you. <laughs> You'll be facing south. That's another way to get to south. But what we want to focus on tonight are two constellations right here. Now, of course, Saturn and Jupiter happen to be right by Sagittarius. Let's go ahead and turn the constellation arc back on. And you can see Sagittarius right over there with the bow and the arrow. And right next to it, you happen to have Scorpius or the Scorpion. Now, for all the folks that love animation movies and have seen Moana, the tail and the stinger of Scorpion is Maui's fish hook. Let's draw that out. And here you have it. That is Maui's fishhook for you. And it's been used for navigation by our ancestors. Now, again, that is an asterism. To the left of it, how many of you actually see a teapot in Sagittarius? If you do, raise your hands. Of course, I'm not going to be able to see those hands. Oh, I guess on camera I can. Thank you, Wolf. I saw that. Appreciate it. But let's go and draw it out for the ones that cannot see the teapot. That is the body of the teapot right over there, the handle of the teapot, the lid of the teapot, and the spout of the teapot. I'll draw Maui's fish trick again, and there you have it. And right in between these, right about here, is the center of our galaxy. So our massive black hole at the center of the galaxy, roughly about 30,000 light years, happens to be in that direction. Please do not visit, it would be a one-way trip. And I don't think Amtrak even sells tickets to go that far. But nonetheless, if we were to come back to Sagittarius, right above the spout, almost about the same triangle height above and stretched just a bit, you would find the Trifid Nebula right about there. We'll be taking a look at that as well tonight. And then to the left of the lid, somewhere about here is M22, the globular cluster that we will also be visiting. So let's go ahead and zoom in very quickly and we will get to the next part of the night sky show. So I'm just going to go ahead and start zooming in a bit. And I should start seeing M20. Oh, there we have it. M20 happens to be right there. Perfect. So of course, this is uh, an image through the Stellarium application. This is not an SJA image that you are seeing right now, but we will be getting to that very, very shortly. Carl, the Trifid Nebula, the word Trifid, can you t help our viewers with some more information about what that means or how that came about? Well, the word Trifid refers to uh, divided into three lobes. As an aside, in 1960, Trifid uh, was actually discovered by Charles Messier in 1764. And as mm -hmm. an aside, 200 years later, in 1962, there's a horror movie produced named Day of the Triffids. Now Triffids, the Triffidus, refers to the three little legs that the stinging plants use to walk along dry land. Oh wow, that's pretty awesome. So a Triffid really means three lobes or, or the nebula divided into three lobes, and that's how it got its name. But pretty much 
198 years after uh, the Trevor Nebula was found and named, you're saying a sci-fi movie was created where you had these apparently sentient plants that had three feet? Yes, they weren't actually wow. sentient. They just walked around and stung people to death. Even better. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. And to the left of the lid of uh, Sagittarius teapot, we have M22, which is the globular cluster. Uh, how many stars are in M22? And I think the other name of M22 is the Great Sagittarius Cluster, also known as the Cracker Jack. There is about 80,000 stars in there. And it's pretty close by. They're only 10,000 uh, light years away. Wow. Well, that's pretty awesome. All right, very cool. So let's go ahead and zoom back out. Uh, the couple of fun things that you guys got to learn tonight uh, in the, the Stellarium application, of course, how to get to it, stellarium.org. You can get into um, full screen mode and all it takes is using the search box or turning on some of the features at the bottom, the constellation art, uh, the constellation lines, clicking around and uh, navigating through the viewport. A very fun way of learning about the night sky. So I'm going to get out of the full screen mode here and we'll go back to the slide deck. But Carl, as folks want to learn more about the night sky, what else can they do? Well, the most important thing is go outside and look up. Otherwise, you could look at books, um, magazines, or use that uh, app that Rashi just used, uh, Stellarium.org. You can also join the SJAA. And that's a, did I miss anything, Rashi? Well, no, you're absolutely right. And they can join, you can join the SJAA. We've got a, fun, a lot of fun programs. Uh, you know, we're also, we've, we're, we've gone virtual. Uh, we do a lot of fun, different things. Conch talked about, talk about the different, uh, different programs that we have and the outreach that we do. In addition to that, um, you know, as Wolf always says, it's just the price of one pizza. It's only $20 a year. And you get to enjoy a lot of the member benefits so definitely do join us. And if you happen to be a student and want to help us out, whether you are a high school student or a college student and want to be an intern and help us out, please go ahead and reach out. We will have some email addresses for you uh, in a slide at the end of the show, but it'd be great if you're interested in astronomy or you just want to help out and learn, come on over, we'll help you learn. Now, Carl mentioned um, star charts. Now you can go to skymaps.com into the download section and actually print out a couple of sky maps um, for yourself. Now you can do this, you know, so the, the, it's available for you per month, uh, but keep in mind it's available both for the Northern Hemisphere and for the Southern Hemisphere. It comes in uh, pretty much a two page format where the first page has a view of uh, the constellations and a lot of the Messier objects. Uh, it also talks about what is visible through the course of the month. And then on the back sheet, it tells you what could be visible with the naked eye, what's visible by the binoculars, and what would be some telescopic objects that would be fun to take a look at that month. And uh, not to forget, the Perseids meteor shower is currently active in the night sky. It did peak about three days ago, but it's not too late. The Perseids meteor shower is going is continuing until the beginning of September, September 1st. So definitely this is the weekend time. Get out there, get out to a dark night sky and watch some meteors uh, streaking through the night sky, some shooting stars. And of course, the first one that you get to see, make a wish. And I wish that all your dreams come true. And now we're gonna get into the quick segment section, uh, the quick Q and A segment, uh, segment. And we've got a little bit of a solar system humor for you in the picture right below. Some of you might get it, some of you might not get it. And if you don't get it, definitely that might be one of the questions that you ask, uh, but we thought we'd bring a little bit of humor in for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing such that we can bring the entire panel back up and we can answer some questions for you. While the rest of the folks answer some questions, I'm going to go ahead and quickly segue to get things ready for the next segment. Rashi, I'm going to take the screen. Sharing. Yeah, I was trying not to share so that way everyone is uh, visible uh, on camera. Okay. So, uh, that, but it's totally up to you. 
no, this is great. All right. All right, uh, folks. Uh, we've been having a pretty lively discussion on on the YouTube chat stream. A uh, lot of interesting trivia, lots of questions, mm -hmm. and some of the questions we have been able to answer. Uh, Marianne and Nancy and Wolf all have been contributing to answering some of the questions. But there have been a couple of questions that have us stumped. And I would like to bring those questions to the experts here in, in, the, in the panel. Uh, first question is from uh, C.P. Venkatesan. And he wants to know, he has a question about telescopes and probably can't, you can answer this question. Some telescopes say astrograph on them, for example, the Orion 6-inch Newt astrograph, and appear to be built specifically for astrophotography. Can these be used for visual observation too with eyepieces? Well, since you mentioned me, I will try to answer, but I think there are... Uh, well, let me answer yeah, something I, about the experts. I, I, I forgot to in. say this. Oh, sure. I'll just mention something, uh, Glenn, yeah. first, because uh, I forgot to say this. Uh, we are not professional astronomers. I was going to say this earlier in our introduction. However, among us, uh, we have been doing astronomy as a hobby for many years, and uh, we do have collective knowledge of the, uh, the subject astronomy. So just want to put it out there. Go ahead, Glenn, please answer. Yeah, so I, uh, the, I, I, don't, I won't go into the, all the differences. I mean, there's four or five ways that things are optimized to be an astrograph versus a, a visual. Um, but it, the question specifically was about, can you use an astrograph for visual? And the answer is yes. The only thing you might want to be aware of is where in distance from the telescope, the thing is going to come to focus is probably farther away uh, than you might expect from a, from a visual scope. So you might need an extension tube or something because part of uh, making something into an astrograph is making sure that there's enough of uh, what's called back focus or distance uh, between the telescope and where it comes to focus. So you can put in a lot of gear, filter wheels and, and whatnot. Um, so that would be the, the main difference. So you might need an extension tube and your diagonal, you know, an eyepiece might be further away from the telescope than you might expect. Can I provide a little bit more? Um, I've used um, astrograph uh, Newtonians, and I've also used um, you know, visual uh, Newtonians, and I've interchanged them so they, you can definitely use one or the other for either the astrophotography or for visual. Um, potentially one other difference is that uh, the astrographs have larger secondary mirrors in order to illuminate large camera sensors, as opposed to your eye, which doesn't need, is, is, is much smaller than those large camera sensors. Uh, you don't need as large of a mirror. Um, the benefit of having the larger secondary mirror is that you get a larger, uh, you can illuminate a large camera sensor, but then the drawback is when you're using it for visual, um, you're, you're blocking more of the light coming into the telescope, so you're, 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 not, you're just not getting as much um, aperture um, as you would otherwise. So, but the, I'd say the differences are minor, they're not like drastic, it's not like you You'll, you'll, you'll have a yeah, lower lower contrast for for planets and and lunar, uh, right. which you make up for when you're doing photography just with with exposures and whatnot. But, mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Thanks, Glenn, and thanks, Joe, um, and Conch, you as well. Um, the next question is from T. Smith. Uh, when we are talking about binary star systems and multiple star systems. The question is, what is the largest number of stars observed in a multiple star system? So at least from what I, I have read um, and, and know uh, to date is multiple star systems beyond triples are, are hard to find. Um, how Further, have we gone on, you know, systems beyond three? I mean, of course, the, beyond three would be more uncommon. Um, and I, it, from what I've read, we've been able to find five-star systems, but beyond that, I don't know. Uh, I think can't, I, I think just messed it up a that, little yeah. bit, so can't, okay, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I can chime in on a little bit. I think a, ahead, the seven is the highest we had, uh, the scientists had found. Now, that doesn't say there are no more than seven, but uh, it's very common, by the way, our sun is a, kind of an exception. 
uh, it's uh, most stars are either two or three star systems. So I believe that three star systems mm -hmm. are the most common uh, out there. Uh, and then, uh, well, there are a few stars that you may already know, like the, uh, Sirius, the dog star that Nancy mentioned, is a uh, two star system. Uh, Polaris, that everybody knows, is a three star system. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's other stars called Double Double that everybody knows, not the Inner Now Double Double that's uh, out there right now. That's a four star system, so so forth. But when you get to too many stars in one, and what what the multiple stars are actually stars that are gravitationally bound. So they are rotating in different configurations um, in their common center of gravities. Uh, so when you have too many stars in those kind of systems, the, the orbital mechanics becomes uh, so chaotic and they get flung over, so they don't really survive. So I think that's why uh, the scientists can find more than seven stars, but it doesn't mean that they're not out there. Uh, Wolf, if you want to add something to that, you can add it now or in your segment. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I also didn't know the answer off the top of my head. I also had to quickly look it up, right? Uh, so we're all learning these things. Like Hans said, we're not professional astronomers. We're just winging it because we like this stuff. Um, <laughs> so uh, so looking this up, I found a reference to a paper from 2008 where they surveyed about uh, four and a half thousand uh, bright stars. It's just a sample, right? And out of that sample, about 2,700 were singles. About uh, 1,500 were binaries, about 280 were triples, uh, about 85-ish were, were uh, four uh, in the system, 20 had five, 11 had six, and two had seven. So that gives you an idea of what the distribution is, at least in that small sample set, right? Of course, there are many more stars out there in the galaxy and in the universe. You can help us look at all of them and, and see if we can find an eight-star system out there. You know, sign, please sign up. Yeah. So one of the other things is right, when you actually have multiple star systems, just very quickly, I'm not going to take my time, uh, that there's usually dominant stars. So it's very hard to detect them uh, because they are uh, shadowing each other. Uh, the dimmer star is hard to detect. So that actually makes it harder to detect. Uh, but the, the overwhelming reason that they are not that many, uh, many, many, uh, like beyond seven star systems is because of, of gravity plays very funny tricks. They will fling those extra stars out uh, and they won't really survive. Yep. In fact, awesome. the brightest star in the sky is actually a double star system, uh, Sirius, which is, yes. um, Nancy mentioned earlier as the, uh, you know, the, the, the dogs, um, you know, during the dog days of summer, Sirius rises in the morning of, in August. Um, and that's actually a double star system, but it's very, very, very hard to see the double star. It's, it says, because the series is so bright, it, it just completely overwhelms the, the companion, which is a very, uh, very faint star. Yeah, even with the, the third star of Polaris, right, that's very, very hard to find. I mean, you can't look at, you can't find it with just a regular visual telescope. All right. All right. Thanks, guys, for all these uh, interesting answers. Awesome. Uh, do we have time for more questions or shall we move on with the rest of our program? Let's move on to the next segment. We will entertain uh, the remainder of the questions in the, uh, the final Q&A. Sounds good. Awesome, thank you, Swami. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. We're now getting into the armchair observing segment. And this time around, I have the desktop version of Stellarium open. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, make sure that we are facing north. Yes, we are. We've got Polaris right here. If you guys remember the, the pan and the pan handle, pointer stars pointing directly to uh, uh, Polaris and the tail star of Ursa Minor. And the first object that we're going to take a look at is Alberio. So I'm going to go ahead and run a script. Uh, Wolf is going to help us out, and then we'll go to the variety of different uh, imagers. Over to you, Wolf. Okay, yeah, thanks, Rashi. Hello again, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Again, hope it's not too hot where you are. So the first object we wanted to visit tonight is a double star. We've talked about them a bunch already, in fact, just in the Q&A session a moment ago. So we're going to visit Alberio that uh, Rashi teased a little bit earlier. So it's a, a double star. We call it a visual double. It's in Cygnus that uh, Rashi showed you earlier, you know, hanging out there in the summer triangle. And uh, yeah, we haven't really talked about star magnitudes all that much, but uh, we call this a magnitude three star. And finally, as the numbers get bigger, the stars actually get dimmer. I know that's really counterintuitive. If you attend one of our intro to the night sky introductory uh, sessions to astronomy, we'll actually talk about how these magnitude scales work. Don't worry about the number too much today. Um, 
But, uh, but yeah, you know, through a telescope, we can look at this star that appears like a single to the naked eye, and we can actually split that into a couple of stars. So do we want to go ahead and get a little closer to it, maybe? So here we have Stellarium kind of scooting over to that stellar neighborhood again, right? There is Alberio, which is the head of the swan. And we're zooming in. Yeah, okay. And so let's see. Uh-oh, we've got uh -oh. a technical, oh, there yep. we go. Oh, there it is. So we had a little bit of suspense there, but suspense is exciting, right? Hey, we didn't know if this was gonna happen. So uh, yeah, so here we have a, uh, uh, an image that we have put into Solarium from another member of SJA, Francesco. So that's a nice image, but we'll get back to this one in a moment. Let me see what I can show you here live. And actually I'm gonna do a really short detour before we get back to Alberio. Let me, let me first share a different double star that I think is much more famous. Here's a double star for you. Um, I imagine that many of you recognize this image, right? Maybe you can pop it into the YouTube chat if you know what this is. And of course, I'm going to give away the answer in just a moment here, right? So may the force is, be with you. Yes, of course, right? This is from the original <laughs> Star Wars movie. Here we have Luke Skywalker on Tentering looking off at you know this uh, double sunset, right? And you know. Most likely a lot of things in Star Wars are maybe not reality, right? You know, it's a science fiction movie, but actually double stars are a real thing, right? And there could be places, you know, in the universe where there could in fact be a Luke Skywalker standing on a planet, right? Looking out at the horizon and seeing a, you know, double sunrise or double sunset. And of course in the movies, you know, this was nicely bookended by then the second image, right? That appeared in the last movie of the series. So, so yeah, so these things are out there, right? And I think Kanch mentioned earlier that our sun is actually an anomaly almost, right? Because most of the stars out there are, uh, tend to be multiples. And it could be that our sun even had a partner early on when the solar system formed, but sometimes, you know, uh, objects, planets or stars actually get flung out of solar systems when, you know, things are really messy early in the formation of the solar system. Yeah, things may get ejected out. So who knows, our star, our sun may have had a partner that got kicked out. Either way, today our star is a single, um, but there are devils out there. So let's go ahead and look at, um, let's see, we'll do uh, click a couple of buttons here and we will go back to here. All right. So remember that uh, you know, we looked at this briefly earlier, right here is still the telescope that's out in my backyard. And uh, you know, while we've been here talking, the telescope mount actually has been slowly following um, the object in the sky, keeping it in view. And apparently because the light is low, my camera looking at the telescope is having trouble focusing. But that's okay. We don't wanna look at the telescope anyway. What we wanna look at instead is what the telescope is actually seeing. Uh, and by the way, I should point out that the setup I have here is a pretty dinky setup compared to the super fancy imaging setup that Glenn, for example, showed earlier. Uh, and this kind of illustrates that there are many ways to do this, right? You know, anywhere from just purely visual astronomy to really hardcore imaging, and there's some stuff in between. What I'm doing here is something called electronically assisted astronomy, where I've taken more or less a visual setup and popped a, a camera in the back. And uh, that gives us something like this. So here, you know, we see the, uh, the field, and there are a couple little dots in the middle. Now, I think there must be a few clouds out there because there should be a few more stars visible, but let's see what we can get out of this. So, um, so yeah, if you were to look through a low power eyepiece, you know, uh, with your own eyes in a telescope, you might see uh, these two little dots there and go, well, that doesn't look like much, but let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit. So here we can go, actually, before I do that, let me, let me actually center it just a little bit. So we have a telescope remote control here and I can uh, scoot that a little bit. And Wolf, while you're doing that, it seems like there's yeah. another member of the family that's trying to get attention uh, and, and join the star party tonight. Is that your cat? Yes, I know. He, he just decided to make announcements. Yep. Uh, if, if you've attended some <laughs> other uh, talks with me, then uh, you've already heard my cat. His name is Zipper. And uh, yep, you know, he chooses to make contributions at times. So uh, please pay attention. He has important things to say. So here, this is the live view. Uh, as you can see, as I'm clicking these buttons that move the telescope around, you can see the little you know, pair of dots uh, actually move on screen. So um, yeah, so it's kind of faint. I think there are some probably clouds obstructing it, but let's still see what we can get out of it. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit. 
Okay, and so here are the stars that telescope is seeing. And uh, yeah, so this is Alberio, right? So uh, what's cool about Alberio is that you see very distinct colors here, right? So we can do some naked eye science actually. So it turns out that the color gives an indication of the star's temperature. If it's yellowish, it's relatively speaking cooler. And if it looks more blue, it'll be relatively speaking hotter. Now, as uh, Rashi pointed out earlier, we believe that this is actually a visual double, meaning these two stars that we're seeing are not gravitationally connected. They just happen to appear in the same line of sight. But actually, I, th I think we're, we're not really 100% sure of this. When I was doing some research, some of the data I found is like, this, there's still a chance that this could be an actual binary system. But if it is, it probably has an orbital period of at least 100,000 years. So maybe when we have an armchair star party about 20,000 years from now, we can give you an update and we can see whether these stars have moved in some way that would suggest that maybe they are indeed a binary pair. But today we're not quite sure and we believe it's a visual double. However, um, it turns out that actually the yellow one here is uh, a binary in and of itself. So the yellow one has another companion that is just too faint and too close for us to see with the technology that we have here. But uh, with much fancier scientific equipment, yeah, we have found that in fact, we are looking really at three stars here, but uh, we can only see you know, these two with the technology we have. But again, the cool thing here is, you know, there's some nice unique colors between these two stars. So these are really fun to look at. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, oh, go ahead. I'm wondering, uh, because we don't get to see any of the other stars around this, these are not zippers eyes, are they? No, they are not actually. Let me, <laughs> let me try to turn on the exposure a little bit more. <laughs> so what I've done here is uh, I have some sliders here that control uh, you know, how long the camera is collecting light before it updates the image. And so now we're taking five second exposures and you can see a few dots here, but, but the image is kind of washed out and you can actually see kind of a little glow around these guys, which suggests there is some cloudiness out there. I'll, I have a picture here that I, I took a snapshot earlier here and here you can see it actually a little better, right? I, I think this was at a time when we didn't have the, the wispy clouds moving yet. So here you can see Alberio again with some of the background stars present. So unfortunately we cannot get that right now live because the weather is not quite cooperating. Oops. Wow, that's very Let's important. quickly zoom in on this once and then uh, we'll go ahead and move on. Yeah, so here you can see again Alberio, you know, with some of its neighboring stars. So it is a very pretty object uh, and a good one to warm us up here as we're going to move on to some fancier objects, you know, with the, uh, with the next imaging session. Okay, so yeah, so let me uh, hand it over, I guess, back to Rashi. And while he does that, um, you know, let me remind you that, you know, our sun is also a star, right? Our sun is a star, other stars are suns. And one question is, you know, where do stars come from? Well, they are born in structures called stellar nurseries. And the stellar nursery is a type of nebula. It's a nebula that consists of a big blob of hydrogen gas. In that hydrogen gas, some of that gas basically ends up clumping into balls. And if you have enough of that happening, right, then, then these balls of hydrogen will ignite into stars, right? So yeah, so hydrogen clouds form baby stars and then the baby stars radiate energy into space and they cause the uh, you know, parent gas cloud to glow. And we're gonna visit that in just a moment. Um, and yeah, and here's again, you know, Alberio from our other member, Francesco. Okay. And yeah, yeah well, one thing I mentioned, good... I, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Please I was going to say one thing I neglected to say is like, yeah. So uh, Al Alberio is about uh, 15 light years away. It says 14.47 here. So um, this means that the light we're looking at and the light we saw through my telescope setup left there, you know, almost 15 years ago. It's been on its way for quite some time, but there are objects that we see where the light has been traveling for millions of years. So this is nothing compared to some of the objects we see. Absolutely. And the bottom left, you can actually get to see Francesca's rig and set up yeah. that, he, that he that he has um, in order to uh, uh, when he took this image. Yep. All right, so we're going to go ahead and zoom out now. Anything else that you want to add uh, on Alberia before we zoom out and then head on nope, over I to think, the next target? I think that was pretty good. Let, let's leave it there, right? And we'll move on and let's see how some of these stars are made. So I'm going to turn the constellation lines back on and we are zooming out. So Alberio is the head of the swan. So mm -hmm. Deneb is the tail star and Alberio is the, the head of the swan. Now, if you guys remember, I'm going to zoom out manually just a little bit more. Summer triangle, Deneb, Vega, and Altair pretty much points 
almost in the southward direction, right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to navigate over to Sagittarius and uh, the next target happens to be the Trifid Nebula. So let's bring some information about that up and then we will get into that vicinity. Yeah. Over yeah, here. so here's the Trifid Nebula, right? Like I mentioned, right, this will be an example of a place where stars are forming. But this is actually a pretty complex object in the sense that it, it's not only a star forming nebula, but it's got some other cool features as well that uh, you know, we'll see in the image. So it's a pretty complex nebula structure where lots of things are interacting that are giving us a pretty interesting shape. So you can see this thing uh, with the naked eye at a really dark site. In fact, that's a lot of fun. Uh, so I hope that maybe you guys can all join us at some future event and you can get back out into the field. And then you know we can show you how you can see some of these objects with the naked eye. It's, it's a challenge and it's a lot of fun to be able to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know this object is called M20. Um, it's one of the objects that was originally discovered by a guy named Charles Messier, and there's a funny story behind that, but we can table that maybe for later. But the key feature of this nebula is that, yeah, kind of as the name suggests, Trifid, Tri, there's like three things going on here, right? So we'll see in a moment what that looks like. And this object is about 5,000 light years away. Um, it's about 40 uh, light years in diameter. So some of these structures out there are huge, way, way bigger than our solar system, right? So our solar system is not even one light year across, not even close. Um, our solar system is measured in light hours across. So these structures we see are sometimes really, really big. And this thing is about, yeah, 300,000 years young. And yeah, that really is young in astronomical terms. You know, compared to the universe being 13.8 billion years old, 300,000 years is nothing. So let's, uh, let's take a look. All right, we're going to be sneaking up on it here, zooming in. Boom, there it is. Isn't that a beautiful image? And uh, Bruce can show us and tell us more about it. All right, thanks, Wolf. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, I'm going to actually show you. Uh, I'm going to actually show you guys a, a video of uh, the uh, subframes that were taken to make that image. Um, it's also the image behind me. And I have a live stacking video showing uh, all the constituent images being put together to make a better image. Um, each image is 220 seconds long. And uh, normally, uh, you know, uh, most astrophotographers uh, are doing uh, multiple frames and adding them together, you get a better signal to noise ratio. There are a lot of reasons for uh, doing short frames and adding them together. Um, so let me start this video. And so this program Sharp Cap can be used for capturing each image, but you can also have it look at a, uh, a folder on your computer and put the images together and it shows you the image being updated as it does it. Um, down here on the bottom right, there are places, uh, there are um, uh, some things that you can do to change the amount of uh, brightness and darkness where the black point is, where the white point is in the image as it's being stacked. And you can change the color um, balance of the image uh, by hitting this, uh, this little lightning bolt here or this diamond here, star shape. And if you look over here, you can see this is 28 and counting images that are being stacked together. And it's basically, um, if we were to zoom in on it right now, you would see it's kind of grainy, but as each image is added on top of the other, you get less grain. Um, the more images you get, the more accurate your stretch can be. And uh, so, when we're doing this live stacking, um, generally you want to recalibrate it, re, uh, restretch it. You can change these sliders down here to uh, make it a little brighter or darker. Um, so as, as we're getting to the end of the stack, uh, we're 50 frames now. I wanted to move that histogram down and I'm going to uh, move the other part on the right side out and we can zoom in a little bit. Um, so the Triffid Nebula is on the bottom left and the 
big, beautiful nebula there, the Lagoon Nebula, M8 on the top right is a close neighbor. Um, the M8 is uh, a star forming region also, and uh, it's about 4,100 light years away. Um, absolutely amazing to look at it through a beautiful, you know, really nice refractor. It is gorgeous. Um, and now we're gonna zoom over and take a look at the Trifid. Um, scroll over and zoom in a little bit. Uh, the Trifid is a combination of um, emission nebula and uh, reflected, reflection nebula. Uh, the bluish parts are reflecting uh, light from a star. Uh, I don't have the name at hand, but they're reflecting light directly from a star uh, that's in there that uh, is a younger bluish star and it lights it up um, with a, a white blue light. Uh, the reddish part actually is uh, hydrogen gas that is um, emitting light and it emits in that general color. Um, when uh, radiation hits the gas, uh, I think it's when uh, it, it hits the gas and uh, knocks off an electron and when it, the electron comes back and recombines, light is, is released, something to that effect. Um, and that is what makes the Trifid and the Lagoon glow red. Um, and uh, th these images were taken uh, with the Takahashi telescope. I'm gonna show you that real quick. I'm gonna have to stop screen sharing and start it again. Uh, this telescope right here with this mount, um, taken a couple years ago at Likely Place, uh, a very dark place in Northern California. And uh, at a star party for stellar view star parties, uh, or stellar view telescopes rather, um, they do that every summer. Stellar view are great telescopes. I happen to have a Takahashi at that star party, but uh, I now own a stellar view, as does Wolf. I see. Uh, anyway, uh, I think that's basically it. I, I would show you a live shot, but of course it's very cloudy here right now. So this is what I have to share tonight. Oh, yeah, thanks Bruce, that was nice. Yeah, unfortunately the clouds we can't control, they do what they will do. Um, but uh, it was really nice to still see these images. I think I was impressed. I, I think these are really cool. So yeah, so the Trifid is among other things, a star forming region, like we said. So stars are born, you know, then stars live for some amount of time. Our star, our sun has been around for about um, eh, four and a half, five billion years or so. And eventually, um, you know, they will die. So what happens is the stars form in the, in the like something like a trivet, like we said, then all these new stars hang out for a while on something we call an open cluster. And then they turn into a uh, star that dies eventually into something called a planetary nebula, very confusing name, or a supernova remnant. Um, and today we don't have those as part of the images, uh, but actually in terms of supernova, we have a surprise for you a little bit later. I think Rashi already mentioned that as well. So we'll see that in just a moment. So there's a whole stellar life cycle that we could talk about and we discuss those things in, in other sessions. So please join us for those in the future. But now we're gonna go on to an object that is actually not exactly within our galaxy. The things we've seen so far, they're all within the Milky Way galaxy, right? So if my hand here were the Milky Way galaxy, a collection of lots and lots of stars, kind of flattish and imagine a spiral structure here. It's the galactic core that Rashi pointed out earlier. We live about halfway away and the Trifid and Alberio, all these things we've seen are in this, in this galactic structure. The next thing we'll look at is something called a globular cluster. And that is like a ball of stars that is a companion to the Milky Way. It doesn't quite live inside the structure. It's a little bit outside. And these are things that orbit around and through the Milky Way. And we know of about 150 of these things. And we're going to visit this particular one called M20. So you want to go ahead and zoom in on this? M22, little ball of stars? small correction. I'm sorry, M22, yes. I misspoke, <laughs> thank you, yes. Yeah, we just looked at the M20, yeah, beautiful pictures by cool. Bruce, thank you, Bruce. Uh, now, if you guys remember from the earlier segment of the show, M22 happens to be also uh, in Sagittarius on the left side of the lid of the teapot. So let's go ahead and, and bring the, uh, the slide up, and then we will go ahead and narrow in onto the cloud cluster. 
Yeah, so we'll see a globular cluster and you'll see in a moment what this looks like. These objects are beautiful. Um, I think of them as maybe a bunch of diamonds that got dropped onto like black velvet, you know, at a jeweler. So if you can imagine that, you have a good idea of what to expect here in a moment. And globular clusters, yeah, you can again, you can see them maybe with the naked eye at really dark sides, but certainly with binoculars, you can see these and they're fun to hunt for because there's a whole bunch of them you can find. Um, and they tend to be on the order of like 10,000 or so light years away, 10 to 20,000 light years. This particular one is about 10 and a half. So that means the light we're going to see will have been traveling for you know 10,000 plus years. And again, these things are really big in diameter. So this is a hundred light years across. And uh, yeah, these things tend to contain on the order of you know, 100,000, 200,000 stars. Maybe this one's a little bit on the low side, but it's still really beautiful. So let's go ahead and zoom in on this one. Yeah, and just imagine a massive chandelier above you, right? You've got a lot of yeah. light all around you. And I imagine if you were a planet inside a globular cluster, what would your life really be like? Would it be sunlight all time brown, different uh, wavelengths of light? It would be fascinating and absolutely interesting. It, it would indeed, yeah. So the sky look, would look very different if we were inside a globular cluster. Um, you know, there would be way, way more stars in the sky and the night sky uh, would be brighter than our night skies with a full moon. We'd get pretty bright when the moon is full, right? But if we had a globular cluster sky, yeah, the full moon line would be nothing compared to the light from all those stars. And here you can see what that looks like. Yeah, there's a nice little ball of stars. These look really beautiful also through visual telescopes. So, uh, okay, why don't we go ahead and uh, look at this live if we can. And I think uh, uh, Nicolas can show us this one, right? No, Glenn's going to show us this one. Oh, I'm sorry. Nicola is going to helping uh, help, is going to help us out with the uh, the fireworks galaxy. Yeah. So unfortunately, uh, looking here on the upper right again, we're pretty much completely clouded out here in in uh, the East Bay, and uh, this object uh, on the lower right uh, is just about to go behind uh, the roof of my house, and in, in any event, but you can see here on the left that uh, you know, we're, we're completely clouded out. You, you should be able to see the cluster right here in the center of this uh, frame here, but, but uh, the clouds are just not letting it show through. Uh, but I did take that picture that uh, was shown a second ago uh, with uh, this telescope uh, uh, about a week ago and uh, you know, I, I, Wolf, Wolf was was talking about some of the differences between you know the the amount of gear that that can be applied, right? So, you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of stuff that that uh, can go into astrophotography. It doesn't necessarily have to, but uh, you know, these are some of the bits and pieces that are are part of this telescope that that I use to take that picture. So so we can. Um, I can bring that up again. Yeah, so that's, uh, and actually this was kind of a, a quick uh, quick shot, um, not a lot of uh, exposure time, so it's a, still a little bit noisy, but just give you an idea of the, you know, all those stars in a, in a tight ball, uh, as Rashi was saying, what would it be like to live on a planet that was orbiting one of these uh, stars and just have your night sky completely filled, completely white. Uh, you wouldn't have a night, basically. It would always be daytime from all these thousands of, of stars. So. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you yep. for sharing. So yeah, uh, you know, now we just said, you know, wouldn't it be cool to live on a planet, right? That's in the globular cluster. Um, but, you know, uh, don't don't buy your tickets just yet to go there. Right. I, I think trying to find a planet in the globular cluster would probably be like trying to find housing in San Francisco, because it turns out that when we look at a globular cluster, the, the stars that we see are actually very old the globular cluster stars uh, tend to be nearly as old as the universe in many cases. Uh, and it turns out that the uh, what astronomers call the metallicity uh, in these globular clusters is low, which means that there is not a lot of stuff from which to build planets and from which to build life. So odds of planets and globular clusters are believed to be pretty low. So yeah, don't buy your ticket just yet to go there, although it would be really cool if we could. So, so in essence, pretty much what you're saying is real estate is extremely expensive and pretty darn old. Exactly, yes. <laughs> Definitely a fixer up there if you go. <laughs> All right. Anything else here are... that we want to? 
Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I think that's good. I think these are beautiful objects, right? So definitely, if you have an opportunity to look at a globular cluster, you know, through a telescope with your own eyes, uh, it, it's definitely something beautiful to see. I, I've certainly heard lots of wows, you know, when people see these objects for the first time. So go check it out if you can. Yeah, if you get, if you happen to go to a dark sky site or even a, one of our dark sky star parties when you get to start them again, there are a few globular clusters that you could see uh, and look at that. I think this is one of them. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so like we just said, you know, a globular cluster is not quite a galaxy object. It's really a companion to our galaxy, right? I just kind of used my hand to model a galaxy, right? Because galaxies are these flattest structures and these like globulars go around. Um, but our galaxy is not the only one. There are many other galaxies out there. The nearest one is about two and a half million light years away. That's the Andromeda galaxy. That's also a cool object to try to find with the naked eye. So maybe that's something we can show you one day under a dark sky. Uh, but there are many other cool galaxies out there that we can see. And that's going to be our last object for tonight. So we're going to visit something that we call the fireworks galaxy. So maybe we can scoot over there. Yeah. So uh, it's a spiral galaxy. Like I said, many galaxies look like spirals. And this one is very beautiful. The spiral will be very obvious when you see that in a moment in the picture. Um, this galaxy is also in Cygnus. It's a really cool area to find fun stuff. Um, so to see this, you do need a telescope. Many galaxies are not easily visible with the naked eye. You need at least binoculars to make out that there's something out there. Uh, this thing is about 22 million light years away, right? So contrast that with the globular cluster, which was about 10,000 light years away. So now we're talking, yeah, a much bigger distance. And this kind of highlights the fact that telescopes are also time machines. You know, we, these are really instruments that allow us to look back in time because the light that we're seeing is light that was generated 22 million years ago in the case of this galaxy. Uh, and this galaxy is about 40,000 light years in diameter, which is actually smaller than our home. The Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. Um, but this galaxy is really cool because as this one feature that, that was mentioned before is that, uh, yeah, this thing has a lot of supernova activity and the supernova is a really big star blowing up. Supernova explosions are some of the most energetic events that we know of. Um, and supernova explosions are uh, engines that produce material, right, that then planets are made from. So we live here today in our neighborhood because there must have been some supernova explosion in cosmic history in this neighborhood of Earth because our planet is made from stuff that was at some point manufactured in a supernova explosion. So I think this is really cool stuff to think about. And so let's actually take a look then at this galaxy and uh, we can talk some little more about supernova. Yes, and um, you know, if we remember from the earlier segment, uh, the fireworks galaxy happens to be between Cepheus and Cygnus. So we're going to head back over northeast and uh, take a quick look. So here we're south facing M22 by Sagittarius. And now we're moving back over right between Cepheus and Cygnus. Yeah, check this out. Isn't this a beautiful image? You can definitely see the spiral structure here, right? Uh, and with the bright galactic core in the middle. And we do know that galaxies um, you know, have giant black holes at their centers, as does our galaxy. So yeah, so that's something to think about and imagine. And uh, yeah, let's have our imagers look at this a little bit more and show us more details. Nicola, all yours. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Nashi. Um, so I'd like to show you um, some of the uh, recordings of real time imaging of this galaxy, Paralos Galaxy. Right now it's cloudy in San Jose and uh, it's impossible to see the galaxy. But um, I made a special trip uh, to a remote location near um, uh, the Bay Area a few days ago. I was able to capture some images. Um, First of all, I want to show you what the galaxy looks like in a real-time uh, imaging. Uh, just let me share the screen. Okay. Okay. All right. So what you are currently seeing is um, when I was I was there, it's actually it's a location near Morgan Hill, um, and what you currently seeing is a real time I mean a recording of real time imaging from one of my telescopes. I have two of them. So the imaging that you see is actually a recording from uh, my Takahashi telescope, 
And uh, if you take let's uh, subframes, um, the actual fireworks galaxy is not very bright. Um, it's actually a little bit dimmer. And on, on the right, you can see the open cluster, uh, which was actually on Stellarium uh, as well. So you can actually see both of them. Um, so eventually, when you collect enough images uh, like these and you stack them with the proper software, you will end up uh, to something like this, right? Um, what I'm showing you right now is one of uh, my uh, recent uh, results, where actually you can see the both the open cluster and the Fargus galaxy next to it. Um, just like in the Stellarium, right? So you can confirm that Stellarium is actually accurate, right? The same thing. Um, so what is typical for this galaxy is that, um, as I mentioned, Rashi mentioned before, is that, and uh, Wolf, is that this galaxy is very active into uh, supernova events. Um, and uh, we had actually uh, two members of the club, um, which actually, they managed to capture images. Hey, of Nicola. Sorry to bother you. Do you have your camera on or intentionally off? Uh, no, it's actually off because the, okay. the weather is bad. Yeah, so I'm just... Uh, just... No, the, your webcam. Oh. So we can yeah. see you. Just a second. Yep. <laughs> Sorry about it. Uh, where it is? Lower left, maybe. Uh, you, you had it when you clicked on more. The three dots that have more, mm -hmm. there was start video right oh, okay. in there. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I don't know whether you can see me because I'm next to the telescope. Um, I was hoping to image today, but I cannot because uh, yeah. Can you see my face? <laughs> I'm here. Uh, here's the telescope next to me. But uh, it's not in idle mode because the clouds. Um, so the telescope is actually yeah. semi-permanent. I don't take it out uh, because I usually take images every other days. Um, yeah, that's, that's one of the rigs that I have. Uh, it's a refractive telescope with a CCD camera, which is uh, cooled with uh, actually keep the temperature low for a low noise. And it's actually especially equipped with uh, filters called narrow band filters, which actually allows the telescope to actually reduce the light pollution. And we can actually take images with uh, for nebulas, right? But it can be it uh, can be modified for galaxies too, right? But it has to be outside the cities, right? So not from city skies, right? Okay. Um, so, um, so back to the topic in on, on the on the fireworks. So, what what makes this galaxy so uh, interesting is. So, I want to show you um, one of the the news. If you look at my screen, so this was one of the first news back in 2017, May 14, uh, when I saw this actually on a site called Astro Telegram. This, this web page is actually where professional astronomers, they post news about supernova. So whenever they actually capture supernova event, they post it on this web page. And they usually say, um, they go public and say, hey, guys, can you confirm we see supernova? And this was the first one of the first actually letters. They can see a supernova in the, the Fargus galaxy in 2017. And then I was very excited and I sent email to our science astronomy club and say, hey guys, can, can we start imaging, right? And I remember that Glenn and Joe, they actually took images. I also took images from a remote telescope too, but they have really nice images. I really want to uh, give them the ball to present, uh, to show you what they have. So, Glenn. Uh, you caught me uh, off guard. I wasn't wasn't expecting. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm gonna go ahead yeah. and move to the uh, to the embedded slide, and I think it has all the images, and we can talk about yep. that. Okay. okay. Yeah. There we go. 
So Glenn, your image is on the bottom left. Yeah. Uh, and Joe, your image is on the bottom uh -huh. right. Nicola, your recent image happens to be on the uh, top right. Now I am losing some resolution here within uh, Stellarium. So give me one quick second. Let me swap this out with the actual slide that we have in the deck. There we go. So uh, Glenn and Wolf, you guys want to talk about, um, uh, we can go in sequence. Glenn, we can go first with your image and then Joe yours and then Nicola yours last. Well, my my image was taken with the same uh, telescope. the The setup was a little different. I was just looking on, uh, you know, where we we post our images on a site called Astrobin. You can sort of think of it like the very loosely sort of Facebook for for astro imagers, um, where you can like and and uh, you know upvote people's images and stuff. So that this was from 2017. So I I think I was living in. Uh, I know I was living in in Scotts Valley at the time, so so it's a little different, a uh, little different setup uh, before some of the gear that I have now. But the the main telescope and the mount are the same as what we've already talked about and shown tonight. Yeah. So it's so Glenn, it's what, uh, what month in 2017. I'm sorry. Uh, what month in 2017 did you capture it? September. September. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's interesting because the image uh, on the uh, the lower right, um, I captured that in June. Mm -hmm. um, so that image actually predated your image by about three months. Um, and you can actually see, uh, you know, right now the cursor is hi highlighting that supernova, uh, that type two supernova that happened in 2017. And between June and September, you can see it faded considerably and actually went from a, a, a whitish hue to a more yellowish hue. Um, and then uh, Nicola can talk about his image, but then uh, I think that one, you know, captured three years later, uh, the supernova has completely faded away. Uh, okay. So it goes to show that even uh, what you Nicola, see in the you sky. Wanna, yeah. Nicola, you want to talk about it? Yes. Um, so this topic is very, very broad. Um, I want to. Uh, again, take the, the, the screen. Just one second. Okay. All right, I've gone ahead and stopped sharing. You want to go ahead and share your screen? Nicola, you still there? Yeah, I'm here, but I'm not able to share the screen. So it doesn't become blue. The button share. Um, I did stop sharing. You should have that option available to you. Let's see if I can. Um... Oh, you should have you should have the access. It looks like it would let me share if I wanted to, so I don't think there's anything fundamentally blocked. Is there any website that you would want one of us to open instead if you're not able to share? Uh, so yeah, I sent actually a couple of uh, sli uh, pictures on the email today. Yeah, um, I'm not going to be able to open that right now. Uh, uh, I'm going to do that. Nicola, do you want the uh, graph? Uh, yes. OK, so let me try to share this and see whether that's what you want. So I, I see it actually as a, as a gray screen. 
my side. Okay. Yeah, so there are three three plots. Uh, if you if you oh, share. Oh, okay. So that graph. Sorry. So let me yeah. try to uh, type two categories. So yeah. Yeah. So, let me try so to um, the the category of the supernova in the Pharos galaxy is type two P. Um, so um, supernovas. They they are uh, broad uh, different categories of supernovas. Type two is a core collapse supernova, which is actually happening when the star is very massive and when the mass is the, the star is too high so the mass is actually uh, is trying to counterweight against the pressure because the, the star is actually um, uh, has uh, is a hot right and it, it tries to expand the pressure is trying to expand the star and the mass is actually the opposite the mass is trying to actually squeeze the star and the mass, the balance between the two is actually in the, the famous equation uh, formula from Einstein, EMC square, right? So you have the energy on the left and the mass on the right. So when the balance is actually, the mass is more, so the pressure, is the, actually, the star is actually starting to, to collapse, right? And um, this collapse is actually going further until it actually reaches a specific uh, density of the matter. Uh, usually, this matter is uh, uh, neutron matter, which is rich with neutrons and uh, heavy elements. And at certain moment, it's called Chandrasekhar mass. It actually expands backward because you cannot um, pressure, you can actually squeeze the star to in indefinitely unless you get to a uh, black hole. And um, this this kind of event is called core collapse supernova two type two uh, supernova. However, um, there are different categories of these events. And this, this depends on uh, how, uh, how fast the, the explosion happens. So is it, is it an immediate event or it takes some time? And if you look at the, the plot, it's called super, uh, supernova type 2P, right? There is a plateau. So there's a plot showing the energy flux versus time. So the energy flux is how much energy is, is actually emitted from the star totally for a specific time period. And this is actually determining how bright is the, the supernova. So the more energy it emits, the brighter the supernova. So we can actually see it from the Earth, right? Now the question is, is this uh, energy released in a bank or is it released in a kind of slow and gradual process? That's very important because if uh, usually it tells us that if the star is actually exploding but slowly, that means that the physics is different. So usually when supernova is actually slow, that is related with hydrogen absorbing the light. So we have hydrogen in the star, but this hydrogen absorbs the light and that makes actually less energetic the event. Right? It's a slow event. And the star is like a jelly, a little bit like a jelly. Right? It doesn't explode immediately. Um, well, if you look at the, uh, the supernova type uh, 2N, uh, which is at the bottom, that's a different case where uh, actually the explosion is super fast. So it's actually like a, immediately like a bang. And in this case, we have more emission of light. Right, that's what makes what makes the supernova super very very bright. But in this case, this energy is released in a very short time of period of time of uh, the scales. So usually, um, the supernova type two n are about forty to sixty days. Right, so that's the typical time uh, when this this events happen. The, the star is really bright, and then after forty days or fifty days, is is gone. Cannot see it on the sky anymore. But in the case of the uh, the supernova in 2017, it took more than 100 days uh, to actually uh, to become the star, the supernova dimmer, right? And that's important because it tells us that this supernova is from the, the this category of events which are slow, and it tells us that the the the, the structure of the star is more like a jelly. <laughs> it's not a uh, 
Nicola, your voice cut off. Hey, Nicola. All right. Yeah, I think alien aliens yeah. got him. Yeah, I think so. So let me try to fill in <laughs> some things. Uh, oh, you are there, Nicola? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Go ahead. Right. We lo we lost you for about uh, five seconds, Nicola. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, so I was talking about uh, why why these curves are important is because uh, scientists they usually have certain models, mathematical models, physical models they compare with data. And they say, when we run a model on a computer, I need a supercomputer to actually calculate uh, these models, right? In order to get to the real supernova model with one exaflop machine, supercomputer, which currently doesn't exist, right? Um, and usually scientists, because these computers don't exist any, uh, yet, they have to do some sort of approximation or extrapolation. And these light curves that we see from the supernova, they're very important because scientists get uh, feedback from the data, how good the models are, right? Actually, how much is there error from the models, from the supernova models, right? So yeah, that's why um, I wanted to point to these curves and why, why it's actually interesting to see these events. And yeah, I want to give back the ball to Rashi. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Nicola. Um, I do want to call out and, you know, come back to this slide for a quick second. And Nicola, when was this image taken? The one on the top right? Um, when this year? Uh, my, my image actually was taken two days ago, right? Um, it's actually uh, August uh, 12th or 11th, actually this week, right? Wow, very cool. Yeah. It's very, very so, recent. Yeah, and then as you can see, I've got two arrows pointed here, and right between the arrowheads, as compared to the other images that we have from Joe and Glenn, where you can actually see the supernova, and of course, dimming, uh, because Joe took it, I believe you said, Joe, it was in July, and uh, Glenn, you yeah. took yours yeah. in uh, September? Yes, yeah, September, yeah. September yeah, June, 2017. June 2017. Okay. And, uh, and the image up top by Nicola was just taken a few days ago in 2020. And you can definitely see that the supernova, supernova is no longer visible. It's, it's not there. Wolf, anything that else that you'd like to add on this slide before uh, we move to the next segment of the show? I think we've definitely come to the end of our armchair observing segment. But anything yeah, like well, I think add? we've covered this pretty well. Let's, let's move on. Thanks. Awesome. Joe, the next Could segment is... Oh, okay. Joe, the next segment is uh, for some night vision astro gear or astronomy. I know it's pretty cloudy out. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to share in this segment for us? Right. So the night vision gear, we won't be able to show live images of it. Um, that's what I wanted to mm -hmm. do, like show the, um, particularly the summer Milky Way was uh, what I wanted to feature. Um, but instead, I'll have some images that I've captured over the years of the Milky Way. Uh, the Milky Way is definitely one of my favorite objects to photograph. Um, it's uh, not difficult to do as long as you have a, a, a DSLR camera with you know, the manual controls on, in a tripod and you go to a dark location, you can capture the Milky Way. So I'm gonna show, um, I've got about uh, seven or eight uh, different images of um, the Milky Way over the years. Yes, please uh, go ahead and share. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So I'm going to start off um, here with an image from uh, CalSTAR. Uh, so CalSTAR is a star party that happens uh, every year between San Francisco and Los Angeles in a dark part of California. And um, this is a, a Milky Way time lapse where it's, uh, you can see the, you can see planes going overhead. You can see, uh, uh, people busy looking through their telescopes, a uh, really fun time and a, and a great group of people to, to be with. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show what was a small uh, meteor um, that went through. Uh, and it's right around, let's see if we can get that right moment here. Um, there we go. Slow down the playback.
There it is. You guys see that? Okay, so that is, um, just this past week was a Perseid meteor shower. And you can see this is an example of uh, a meteor that went through uh, the grounds at Kelstar that evening. Uh, it looks a lot like a, a Luke Skywalker's lightsaber. Um, and then you can see it left behind this uh, smoke uh, ring, uh, which is kind of like expanding right where the, the meteor left off. And even like, uh, you know, this is perhaps over the course of an hour. So even an hour or so later, you can still see that uh, smoke ring, which is pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to show you another one also from Calstar. Uh, this, this combines a Milky Way with a panning um, image. So with a little bit of, um, you know, a little device that kind of pans, uh, uh, you know, over time, uh, there's not, not too difficult to find those. You put your camera on it, and then as it pans, it's capturing photos over, uh, over a couple of hours, and you see the Milky Way set, and you also see all of your surroundings. Um, now I'm going to transition to, uh, let's see. These were uh, some uh, time lapses that I shot when I was uh, in Chile. So Chile being in the Southern Hemisphere, the, sky, the night sky looks completely different uh, because uh, here in the northern hemisphere, the Earth basically blocks our view of the southern hemisphere stars. Uh, so you get to the other side of, this, to, of, the, of the Earth, you see the stars that are below our feet, uh, perpetually below our feet. Uh, so this was from uh, the place that I stayed at. I did a time lapse and, and uh, I'll just kind of play that back. Uh, you see the Milky Way rising and then here you can see the moon rising. Um, that's actually the moon brightening up uh, the, uh, the foreground. Uh, the moon creates so much light that it actually washes away most of the Milky Way. Uh, okay, um, so we're going to jump to another one. Uh, this was uh, at an observing location in Chile. Uh, this is a step ladder that's used to look at a look through a very tall telescope and climb to the top of it, which is probably as as high as like a second story building. Uh, this is a time lapse of the Milky Way. Uh, this is the core of the Milky Way where you have like Sagittarius and Scorpius, uh, but in the Southern Hemisphere, it's directly over your head. And there's the Milky Way just kind of twisting and turning in the sky as the night progresses. Um, there's a little bright glow down here, which is actually the zodiacal light as it's getting closer to the dawn. Uh, jumping ahead to another video, um, this is the observing location I was at in Chile. Uh, this is um, San Pedro, Atacama. Uh, there's a bunch of telescopes here set up for rental, uh, and they're also set up for public observing tours to come in and be able to look through them, uh, guided by the owner of the uh, of this little, uh, observing uh, observatory. Uh, a couple things of interest here. Um, the Magellanic Clouds, there's a large Magellanic Cloud and a small cloud just below it. Uh, the Milky Way here on the, on the, on the left. And I'm just going to play back this time lapse. And you can see uh, during this evening, there were tours going on. Um, there was the uh, there were people being led to the telescopes, uh, laser pointers uh, highlighting the different uh, stars in the night sky, and then lots of red flashlights as well. So that's the mandatory color that you must use when you're out there in, in the night sky. Uh, this was um, me climbing up a step ladder to take a look at the um, Milky Way, just uh, posing, uh, getting a nice uh, shot of just feeling like I'm ascending up into the sky. Um, Gerald, were you able to touch it? Um, well, that was just a little bit beyond my reach. <laughs> uh, I can throw my arm, maybe another, uh, what a, 20, 20 to 30,000 light years. I think um, next time I'll, I'll, I'll grab some of it and bring it back to the northern hemisphere. Awesome, awesome. Uh, this was a, a shot of a reflecting pool also in Chile. Um, this is a, called a solar, um, and it's uh, uh, basically a very still water. Uh, and and you, you go out there at night and you can see the Milky Way just reflecting off the, 
off the thing. So it's really a wondrous sight. Uh, because there's so very little light pollution out there, um, you, st you can see stars almost all the way down to the horizon. Um, there's incredible, incredible views. Uh, this is a um, from a, actually uh, Piper Beach near Big Sur, kind of between Monterey and Big Sur. And I went on this um, kind of a astro uh, nightscape tour uh, with um, uh, Rogelio Bernal Andrea, uh, who leads these tours out there, and took us to this, went to this beach here and did this uh, time lapse of the, um, of the night sky and the Milky Way rising. So I'll just play this back. Um, I had that panning device to kind of pan across the beach um, during that time period. Uh, you can see the Milky Way just rising or rising um, over the horizon, just and, and then the waves of the, of, the, of the water crashing into the beach. It was a rather rather chilly evening, actually, but, but definitely a very incredible one. Uh, this is a shot from Yosemite National Park uh, from Glacier Point. Uh, which is uh, kind of like looking down into Yosemite Valley. We've got Half Dome on the right. Uh, there's some waterfalls uh, on the far right. Uh, fairly common place for people to visit in Yosemite, especially during the daytime. But definitely, if you get to go out there, stay, stick around at night. At nighttime, there are uh, astronomy tours uh, at Glacier Point, just kind of in the public areas. And, and you can definitely see the Milky Way there, very amazingly bright in the, in the summertime. Uh, Milky Way is, it kind of arches across from one side of the Assembly Valley to the other. But really an incredible sight. Uh, this is a, a, uh, also Yosemite. This is from Tunnel View, another popular location in Yosemite. Uh, this one um, is taken, you know, right where all the cars are parked. Uh, get out there, you know, go out there on a summer night. Uh, you'll see El Capitan on the left, Half Dome in the background. The Bridal Veil falls in the right, so and then the Milky Way going from one end of the island to the other. Uh, just a couple more photos left. Um, this is from a campground in Yosemite National Park. Uh, this is uh, shortly after everyone had gone to bed. Uh, right by my campground in Yosemite, there's a, a, just a beautiful meadow. I just walked out there to the meadow and then put my camera down and looked up, and there were just trees in all directions and this amazing Milky Way just going from one end to the other. Uh, it was quite an extraordinary sound. A very simple shot composition-wise, but I really liked it. Um, and then this final shot um, I'd like to show is the uh, Summer Milky Way, the core of the Summer Milky Way, uh, captured actually just with a 50 millimeter lens. Um, most people with DSLRs, they come across 50 millimeter, they're called nifty 50s, they're fairly inexpensive, you know, $100 gets you a lens like this. Uh, with also fast aperture f1.8. The 50 millimeters f1.8 uh, in a dark location, you, capture, you can capture the core of the Milky Way. Uh, I think about an hour or so of exposure time, and then you, you bring it out, you can see this amazing uh, like colors of, of uh, the Milky Way, the dust of blocking the core of the Milky Way, and, and then some, uh, some blue and, and yellow nebula, um, and, and, and dust lanes just kind of extending outward. So, uh, so yeah. So kind of to summarize, you know, Milky Way is definitely one of my favorite objects. Uh, you don't need any kind of uh, binocular telescope. You don't need any of that to see it. You can just go out to the countryside, go out to your national parks, uh, rent that cabin out in the, uh, you know, Airbnb, look for something, you know, if you're in California, go out to Yosemite, go out to Tahoe. Uh, you can go out to like Big Sur and on a clear night, you just, in summertime between, let's like, say from July through like September, October, just look up. And you'll see this band of light just really um, arc going from one end of the horizon to the other. Um, and, that, and that's the plane of the galaxy. It's, it's a beautiful summer sight. It's the easiest thing for anyone to see. You don't need any, it's, it's, you look up and there it is. Um, and, and you're looking into like billions and billions of stars, the collective, collective glow of it, just creating, creating this um, arch across the night sky. So, uh, so yeah, I, I wish I could show it with night vision. That was what I wanted to do originally, but instead we'll have to look at some photos I've captured across the years. Um, if we get another chance uh, before summer ends, I'll, I'll see about showing it again. Um, if, if clouds permit, um, you know, we get clear skies, it'll, uh, we'll see it live through the night vision. Uh, and, uh, it's, and we can pan it across the sky. So that, that's, 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 that's awesome, what I want to see. But yep, Yeah, that's yeah, that's awesome. Thank, thank you so much. On the last image that you had, could you bring that up for a quick second? 
of the, uh, the Galactic here? Core. Yes. Uh, could you very quickly trace out with your mouse, perhaps, the uh, the Prancing Pony or the Dark Horse for the folks? Ah, yes. Um, yes, absolutely. Are you, are you guys able to see my mouse? Or do I need to do something to show the mouse? No, we here? can we can see it. Can you bring it? Yeah, there okay. we go. Yeah, so that there's a there's a prancing pony, um, and then you know, this is the hind leg of the, of the pony, and then here's the body of it, and then here's the front leg, and then here's another front leg, and maybe you can see another leg here, and then the head of the pony is there. So that that traces out this horse that sort of is it's a, a, a massive object, and actually if you know where to look for it, you can you can definitely see it with the naked eye. It's sort of like this dust structure that sort of is blocking blocking the glow behind the, uh, the Milky Way. Um, so yeah, and, and whenever you take a south-facing shot, uh, I mean, you can definitely notice the, the Prancing Pony or also the dark, you know, AKA Dark Horse um, in, in a southern-facing shot. It's it's a very pronounced in, a, in, a, in an image uh, and it'll show up and you'll be able to recognize it once you know what you're looking at or what you're searching for. Yeah, so, all right. Well, thank you all for listening to the Milky Way photos um, and uh, back to you, Rashi. Yeah, awesome. Now, I do have an image to show as well, of course, not the quality of what Glenn and all the other imagers and Joe have, but this was taken at GSSP last year on July 1st, and this was around just past midnight. I was southward facing, and this meteor just came right in and just streaked through the night sky, and I was the only one out of all the images at GSSP that happened to catch a big part of the streak. Now, of course, I wish I was a little bit more facing to the right. I would have caught the explosion as well. So right past the edge of the screen, maybe about an inch off, is when it actually exploded. But I was able to catch a majority part of the streak. It was so bright and pretty darn low. Um, that you can actually see the reflection of that light in the, the windshields of the cars or the rooftops of the cars below. And what's very interesting about this, uh, this streak was that once you zoom in to the actual, the early part of the streak as it was coming into, into the atmosphere and burning through, I actually caught the ripple effect of it probably tumbling through the atmosphere uh, as an artifact of the, in, in the image itself. So I thought that was really, really cool. I wanted to show that to you guys. Raji, uh, I have to say, I think I saw the same exact uh, fireball when I was at the Stellar View Star Party, uh, which was around the same time. Uh, I had my back to the, uh, the meadow where everybody was set up and I was helping somebody with some equipment issues. Mm -hmm. And a light behind me started getting brighter and I thought, wow, who's got the white headlight on, you know, and white flashlight. Yep. And um, as I turned around to, to see what was going on, I saw this amazing fireball blazing across the sky. And just as it got right into the center of the, the, the meadow, basically, it exploded. Yes. <laughs> and I, I let out a shout. Um, I thought it was closer to one o'clock in the morning, but looking at your clock, I guess it was around midnight. Yeah. Um, you know, your tag there. Um, it was one of the most spectacular things that I have ever seen. So uh, I can share that with you. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was it was spectacular. It made a whistling sound coming down, and you could you actually heard the explosion uh, when that happened. And you weren't the only one, Bruce. Everybody in that field pretty much either yelled or shouted. It was absolutely amazing, and it was so. But you saw your own shadow, bright shadow on the ground. Now, talking about shadows, what's really interesting is when you are at a very dark sight um, and your eyes really get night adapted you will be able to see a very faint shadow of yourself just because of starlight and it's absolutely absolutely amazing um, I mean you, you, you're probably going to have to find a patch of uh, ground where uh, the shadow contrast can be easily seen but you can definitely see a faint shadow just from starlight which is absolutely amazing wanted to share that with you guys and now we are jumping into our Q&A section. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and bring the entire panel into view. All right, uh, we have one question. Uh, this is about the supernova of 2017 in the fireworks galaxy. 
and the question is that does this supernova collapse to a black hole? Nicola, maybe you want to take that? Yeah, so uh, now I actually have better zoom. Actually, We finally can see you, Nicola, great. Yeah. But we can only see the top half of his face. Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> the microphone is... Yeah. All right, uh, now go ahead. There you go. Go ahead, Nicola, you want to answer that question? Yeah, so there is an article from 2019. Um, uh, this is the one of the last uh, latest articles for that supernova. April 19, 2019, the article is from uh, uh, Caltech. And they actually, um, according to their calculations, uh, that supernova went to directly to black hole. Um, and it did go to actually Newton star, um, Newton star actually mode. Um, so the reason is that the, the, the mass of this star was uh, too high. So it didn't actually have time to explode at all. It actually collapsed directly to black hole. Uh, that's the, what they conclude in the beginning of that. Uh, and they cite a bunch of data from um, Hubble Space Telescope and a bunch of measurements from on ground telescopes. Right. Yeah, I, yeah, that's the, what I found. Yep. Okay, so uh, Swami, are there any more questions? No further questions, Kanch. All right, so let me try to take the screen. Oops. Is it sharing? Yep. All right. Uh, well, that's we are getting to the end of our program today. Well, we did go um, over time, but we had a lot of material to cover here. And before we finish up the program today, I want to just quickly go over the upcoming events that we have for the club. Uh, like I said at the very beginning, we have lots of programs in the club. For next week, we have uh, we have two events here for the imaging program in the middle of the week. There's the imaging SIG meeting. And uh, at the end of the week, we have imaging workshop. And then we also have the guest, guest speaker, I believe, coming up next weekend. Um, and we also have an introduction to astronomy on next Friday. And these two events, uh, Astronomy 101, happened last, yesterday. And then uh, we had a solo observing a couple of weeks back. So that's our events roundup. And uh, lastly, we do need your feedback. We had, this is our third version of this uh, armchair star party, and we want to uh, improve and change uh, based on the feedback. So please uh, take these email addresses and send us your feedback. All right, well, thank you very much for, for the last two and a half hours to giving us the privilege to uh, bring this knowledge to you and, uh, uh, and a round of applause to our volunteers. Uh, for putting the program together and uh, spending this time. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. We're going to stay um, on mute for a little while to monitor the stream. I uh, will turn our cameras off and make sure if you have any last minute questions, please post them in the stream. We'll probably keep it running for another two, three minutes, and then we will stop streaming. Thank you all, and have a great night. And I'll ask the team to turn off their cameras and uh, go on mute. Good night, everybody. <laughs>